live. <laughs> Two minutes late. Sorry, guys. All right. <clears throat> Give me just a second and we'll get started. Uh, I'm going to have to bear with me because um, it's kind of hard to breathe at the moment. So I'm going to be taking some deep breaths. It's not you, it's me. And the first thing we'll be doing this morning is I'm going to get your grades from page 181 of your white book. So you can go ahead and turn to page 181. And I'm going to be asking for those grades in just a second. I drink out of this cup. Oh, yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. I appreciate you might want that. To stir the honey on the bottom because it's kind of at the bottom. Oh, that is really good in my throat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, everybody online, I apologize for being a few minutes late. Um, but I'm here. So, that's good. <laughs> All right, first thing we're going to do this morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning. The first thing that we're going to do is get your grades from page 181 of the white book. So if um, if you remember the homework, and if you didn't do it, it's no big deal. I'm not that kind of a teacher, okay? Um, so I'm going to call your name out. Just tell me how many you missed or what your score is. Because if you look on the um, answer key right down here is your score. If you missed one, you got a 95. If you missed two, you got a 90, so on. Um, so either tell me how many you missed or your score. Either way is fine. If you didn't get to it, it's not a big deal, but you do want to try to get caught up as quick as you can because four weeks is going to go by way faster than you think it does. Okay? Um, and if you get too far behind, it's really, really hard to, um, to catch up. So everybody ready? Yep. All right, Maria. All right, 100. Very good. Marva. 100. Thank you, Katie. I didn't have to get a chance to do it. That's fine. Jara. 100. Thank you. Alyssa. Thank you. Jordan. Jessica N. 100. Thank you. Edward. 100. Thank you. Jeanette. 100. Thank you. Sheridan. 90. Thank you, Emily. Jessica S. 100. Thank you, Brooklyn. Kevin? Okay. Does anybody have any questions about anything that you read or any of the questions that you answered? Were you like, I don't remember reading that or uh, why did I get that one wrong? I thought my answer was right. Anything that I can help you with on your reading? Anything you want me to explain? No? All right, your homework over the weekend is going to be two chapters. And these two chapters are long. And they're boring. <laughs> um, my best, best advice for studying or doing the reading is don't try to do it all at once. Read for 10 or 15 minutes and then go do something else. And the reason for that, and this is good for any program, any uh, studying that you're going to be doing, any, you know, if you go on for another degree or something like that, have you ever stared at a page and realized you had no idea what was on the page? You knew you read it, but you couldn't recall what you read. Well, it's the reason for that is your brain has to digest what it reads. It's like Thanksgiving, right? At Thanksgiving, you stuff yourself and, you, you know, even if you eat more, it's not, you know, 
you're not going to get any more full. You're already maxed out, right? So when you study all at once, it's kind of like that. You're trying to shove more information into a brain that hasn't digested what it's already read. So it's still way back here trying to work on this. And you're trying to put more in. And it just doesn't really work all that well. So it's always best if you're studying to read for 10 or 15 minutes and then go do something mindless. So wash the dishes, fold the laundry, walk the dog, go outside, play with the kids. Um, do something that doesn't take a lot of brain power. And that gives that frees your brain up to be able to digest what you just read. Whether you're consciously doing it or not doesn't matter. Your brain will catalog what it just read and apply it where it's necessary. And then you can go back and read a little bit more and then take a break. That's always the best way to study for retention. Otherwise, you're going to read it and it's just going to go away because your brain doesn't have time to catalog it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, chapters two and three are long. So you're really going to have to take those breaks. So don't put it off until like nine o'clock Sunday night because <laughs> you're probably not going to get it done. I couldn't find it on Audible. I looked it up. The, this book, is it? That, yeah, that book isn't on Audible. The yellow one oh, is. Sorry, the yellow <clears throat> one is the book that I meant. I, I couldn't find it. You couldn't find it? Mm -hmm. Oh. You can try at the end of class. But I, I yeah, find it. other students have told me that they found I haven't checked. I don't know, but other okay. students told me that they found it. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we'll check after class for sure. Now, my book isn't on audit, aud uh, Audible. Um, not at this time. I know I'm... I'm I'm getting a lot of requests for a Spanish version of my book. I'm a department of one, though. <laughs> and I don't know Spanish, so <laughs> that tends to be a bit of an issue. Um, but uh, it, those things are, are coming in the future. I just don't know when. Um, all right. So let's review what we learned on Monday. We covered a whole lot of information on Monday. I mean, a tremendous amount of information. And um, we're going to review if we're going over something in the next 20 minutes. So I'm going to take all four hours and condense it into 20 minutes. Um, so if I go, if, if you see something that you're like, I'm not, that doesn't look familiar. I'm not recalling that. Stop me so we can discuss it because I want to make sure. Class one is the most important class. That is what lays the foundation that we're going to build on from here. If you don't have this down, the rest of it's going to be a little bit harder because then we'll have to try to fill in your gaps as we go. Okay? Sound good? All right. So how do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan. So we're going to follow the care plan, the whole care plan. And Nothing about the care. what does that mean? When I say that, what does that mean? It means nothing the nurses tell you or someone asks you to do nothing that you think you're supposed to do only what's on the care plan. Okay, so let me clarify that. And, and you're absolutely right, but, okay. So what that means is we can't add to it. We can't subtract from it. We can't change it in any way. But the care plan can actually be verbal. So as a nurse, I can ask you, hey, can you go do mouth care on room 315? And that's perfectly okay. It doesn't have to be written. It can be verbal. Remember, we're nursing assistants. So we're going to do the things the nurses need us to help them with. Okay, so care plans can be verbal or they can be written. But the whole point is that we can't change anything. Can't add to it. Can't subtract from it. Can't change it around. It is exactly what they tell us to do. Does that make sense? Okay, while we're doing these things, following that care plan, what should we be also doing? Observing. And we want to observe for anything that looks, smells, feels, sounds abnormal. If it's different, if we're not sure what to do with it. If your brain perks up and says, huh, what is that? <laughs> what do we do with all those observations? Yeah, we report them to the nurse, yeah? We're going to report them to the nurse. Now, sometimes we will chart them, but not always. In most healthcare settings, and we're going to talk a little bit about this a little later, but in most healthcare settings, CNAs do not chart with words. CNAs do not chart with words. Now, the reason for that is that charting 
is a legal document. Legal. That means that any word that you write in that chart can be um, entered into a court proceeding. Now, CNAs usually chart numbers, pulse, respiration, feeding percentages, weight, blood pressure, output, numbers, CNAs chart, but usually not words. Now, if your facility does want you to chart with words, they're going to tell you how you need to do that. Okay, their parameters. But remember that if a lawsuit happens, they're not coming after you. Who are they coming after? The facility. The facility. So we need to make sure that we are documenting exactly how the facility wants us to document because that's their legal precedent. I have a question. Um, years ago when I worked in a hospital, they had a card X that the care plan was on and it was written in pencil and they could erase it and things uh -huh. like that. So is the, is the care plan on the computer now? I don't have any idea. Yes. Most, yeah. Card X is, um, they went away about 20 years ago. Okay. Um, they are, interestingly enough, card X is now are starting to come back into fashion. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. And yeah, card X's are basically mobile care plans. They're, they're written on a little card and they were erasable because care plans change frequently. So it depends on where you go as to what you're going to get. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about shift reports later on in the program, but I do have a lesson on it. If you, um, on page 115, I have a, um, it's called the team's report. It's a way of getting information from the previous shift on the patients that you're about to take over. We call that a shift report. So if you have cared for these patients, all shift, you're getting ready to go home. I'm coming on to relieve you. I don't have my mic on. Um, sorry, guys at home. Uh, I'm coming on to relieve you. Then, um, you're going to tell me what I need to know about these patients. You know, everybody was good. Mrs. McGillicuddy didn't sleep at all last night, so she's probably pretty tired. Um, Henry fell and bumped his head, so we're doing Q4 uh, vitals. Yeah, so there's five things that a CNA needs to know on every patient that you take over care for. Five things. Remember, we do ADLs. You guys remember that, ADLs, right? Tell me what that stands for again. Activ daily living. Yeah, activities of daily living. Okay. So that's what your shift report is going to consist mostly of. So T is for toileting. It's the first thing we need to know. Everybody's got to go every shift. So you got to know how do we toilet them. That's always number one on the list. Toileting is always number one. Eating. Everybody's going to eat every shift too. So we need to know, are they on a special diet? Do they have a fluid restriction? <clears throat> are their fluids thickened? What do we need to know about eating? A is for the rest of the ADLs. <clears throat> Bathing, dressing, grooming. M is for mobility. Mobility always has its own special category because it's um, highly specific. So is the patient on bed rest? Can they get out of bed into a chair? Are they allowed to walk around on their own? What is their mobility? And then S is special. Special is everything else that doesn't fall into those categories. So like vital signs or uh, tests that's coming up that we have to have the patient ready for or families coming to visit or whatever. Special. So if you put all that together, T-E-A-M-S, it's a team's report. And it keeps you very organized as you're getting your report and make sure that you don't miss anything. So yeah, we used to use card X's. They are coming a little bit back into fashion, but the team's report is going to be basically your card X okay. that you're um, getting information on. Okay. Okay? Thanks. You're welcome. All right. So every skill starts with the opening. What does every opening start with? A knock. And that's important to preserve privacy and to maintain a safe boundary for that patient. Um, who are we going to greet? And how are we going to greet them? By name. Yeah, that's an important checkpoint. We have to greet them by name. It's actually on the checklist. Greet resident by name. Now, for the test, we're going to use Mr. or Mrs. Jones. Everybody's just one name. 
They're not going to make you memorize everybody's last name. Once we've done that, once we know who we're working on, what do they need to know about us? Yeah, our name and title. Remember that your name is not not enough. We want to make sure that they know our name and our title. So, hi, I'm Patty. Isn't going to work. I'm Patty. Your CNA does. Okay. They really need to know. Remember, we're doing really personal things on these patients. Like, you don't want a complete stranger that you don't even know their first name doing mouth care on you. That's just awkward. Like, if some stranger walks up to you at the mall with a toothbrush, you're like, um, no, thanks. Um, it just, it, it's rude. It's, it's weird. It's, it's not right. So we've got to make these patients a little more comfortable with us before we start invading their personal areas. Does that make sense? Okay. Once we've done all of that, what do we want to clue them in on? Yeah. What are we there to do? Now, this is something that a lot of students get tied up on. Okay. They're not grading you on your word choice. You can say this any way you want to say it. I'm here to brush your teeth. I'm here to do AM care. I'm here to perform mouth care. You can read it right off the care plan if you want to. That's fine. If, you know, during the test, you get all nervous and tongue tied and you don't know what to say, read it off the care plan. That's okay. But you can also make it a little more conversational as well. It doesn't matter how you tell the patient. It matters that you tell the patient. Okay. Once we've done that, we're going to get something from them. What do we need to get from them? Permission. Yeah, this is important um, because remember that we don't have the right to touch any other person's body without their permission. It doesn't matter whether you're in a grocery store and it's a stranger or if you're in an assisted living facility and it's a stranger, it's still their body and we have to get permission. Don't skip this. Now, I know some of you are like, hold up. What about dementia? They can't give you permission. They don't know what's happening. When you go to work with dementia patients, you'll actually get additional training on dementia, but chapter five is going to cover that in your yellow book as well. Um, when it comes to dementia patients, they don't have um, the ability to give consent because they don't understand what we have um, told them that we're going to do in a lot of cases. So with dementia, we generally don't give them yes, no questions. That's like one of the big things with dementia. You never give them a yes, no. Anybody ever see a two-year-old? I love two-year-olds. They are, they really are like between two and three, my favorite humans on the planet. I love them. They're developing independence. Okay. And part of developing independence and autonomy is learning the word no. And once they learn that word no, man, they use it for everything, everything, everything. So when you're working with two and three-year-olds, if you say, can you put your shoes on, you know what they're going to say? No, no. no, because that is their ability to set their own boundaries. Now, if we develop that ability at two or three, trust me, we're going to use that throughout our entire life. Okay. That's a big, big milestone. That's why I love two and three year olds because they're, they're working on those milestones. Right. And it's, it's a really important one. So if you want to get further with your two or three year old, don't give them yes, no questions because you'll get no every time. What you want to do is give them limited choice. Do you want to put your shoes on now or after you get your backpack? Notice no was not one of the options, <laughs> right? So when we're doing that with young children, limited choice, it keeps them focused on the task and it reduces their ability to say no. We do that with dementia patients as well. Limited choice. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, it's not up to you to decide if a patient has dementia. That is a legal precedent. And this is really important for people to understand when somebody is diagnosed with dementia, there is a legal process that has to be um, gone through to remove that patient's rights of self-determination. It is a legal process. It is not automatic where you can say, yeah, this patient's confused. They can't consent to anything. It doesn't work like that. 
The only person that can remove a patient's ability to self-determine is a judge. Mm -hmm. Does he have to consult with Dr. Sick? Yeah, absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. What's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? Are they kind of the same? We're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get into chapter five. So uh, later next week, we'll talk about that. But a great example, and I'm just going to give you this just because of today. I am sick. We all know I'm sick. You guys brought me herbal tea. Thank you so much. We all know I am sick, right? But that what, what does that mean? What does that term mean? What does sick mean? Not feeling well, but it's very nonspecific, right? Now, when I'm saying I'm sick, you can hear that it's, you know, up here, my sinuses, but could it also be GI? You know, could I may have spent some time in the bathroom this morning? Could I maybe be nauseous if I said sick, right? Sick is a very nonspecific term. It means you're not well, but it doesn't really tell us how you're not well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Dementia is a nonspecific term. It's brain sick. That's what dementia means, brain sick. The brain is sick. But it doesn't really give us specifics as to how it's sick. What, what, is, what is the actual sickness that you're dealing with in your brain? And it could be Alzheimer's. It could also be uh, Jacobson Crutchfield disease. It could also be Lewy body dementia. It could also be Huntington's chorea. It could be uh, Parkinson's dementia. So it could be a multi-infarct situation where you've got lots of little teeny, teeny tiny mini strokes going on in the brain that's affecting its ability to work. All of those things make the brain sick. So brain sick, dementia. Make sense? And we'll get into that a little bit more. Was diagnosed by his doctor years ago with dementia and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And they said that it was both of them, not just one of them. So, what that means is that he has symptoms of Alzheimer's. It's a very specific type of dementia. But he also has some other symptoms that didn't really fit into that category, but we really don't know what's causing them. So, dementia. Yeah, and like I said, dementia can be caused by a lot of different things. So, but each one is a little bit separate. Like, you know, me, I'm sick. Well, that means I have a stuffy nose. It could mean I have a sore throat. It could mean I have a cough. It could mean I've got some GI issues. It could mean I'm really tired or muscle achy or whatever, right? Those are all different symptoms. Um, and not all of them are, you know, due to the same thing. So this patient had... Alzheimer's symptoms. So they diagnosed Alzheimer's, which is interesting because Alzheimer's actually can't be diagnosed until after death. Um, it can't be, it, it can be, um, it, it can be put on as a diagnosis, but not confirmed until after death because you actually have to cut the brain to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. So they use it as a diagnosis, but it really isn't confirmed. There's no blood test we can give you. There's no CAT scan that we can give you to definitively diagnose Alzheimer's. So it can only be definitively diagnosed after autopsy, but we will give you the, you know, diagnosis. Um, but he probably had some other symptoms, especially because Alzheimer's is a very slow onset. And if he went fast, that means he had something else going on in the brain. We don't know what it was. Yeah. So we'll give you dementia as well, because we just don't know. To avoid problems, would we be working with another um, team member when doing specific skills? It depends. It really does. It depends on a lot of things. First of all, it's going to depend on your level of comfort. Okay. If you're a brand new CNA, you're not going to be comfortable with anything, right? You're brand new. It's the only time in your life you can get away with saying I'm new, <laughs> right? But if you've been doing this for five years and you know the patients backwards and forwards and you know how to work with them and you know how to approach them and, and get around their defenses and all of that, then no, you can, you know, work on your own. It, it really depends. It also depends on facility staffing, right? If we don't have somebody show up, eh, you probably may be working alone with, you know, your patients. So there's a lot of things that go into that. I can't really give you the one answer you're looking for. Um, but that's a really good question on an interview when you're new. 
What kind of orientation period am I going to have? Will I be assigned another team member to help me when I get into sticky situations? Is this a patient with dementia? With sure. Like, also depend with the facility that would be working. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So getting consent is actually really important, um, but we won't be getting consent from dementia patients. Okay. And then once we've done all of those things, what do we want to close? Okay, privacy is important. We want to close the curtain. There is one skill that we're not going to close the curtain for. I'll be talking about that later on in the program on week three. But every other skill, we're going to close that privacy curtain. Is that curtain clean? No. So what do we want to do after we close the curtain? Wash our hands. After we've washed our hands, now we have clean hands, we can go get our clean supplies. Now, the most important thing out of all of this, the, the one thing that's got to stand out in neon lights flashing, blinking at you, is that we don't touch the patient until our hands are clean. Yeah, washed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, we also learned the closing. The closing is a way to end every skill. So just like every skill starts with the opening, every skill is going to end with the closing. And there are a ton of C's in this closing, a ton of C's. Um, it doesn't matter what order you do most of them in. Can somebody give me one of the C's? Clean, Clean environment. Sure. We want to make sure that everything is nice and neat and uh, that'll help the patient rest a little bit better. Um, what position does the bed need to be in? Lowest, Lowest position. So that makes it safe. So clean and safe. Um, what word do they need to hear? Comfortable. Yes. And remember, comfortable is not just about physical comfort. It's also about emotional. So what are we going to offer them? Yeah, magazine, word search, book, TV remote, whatever, but offer them something. Um, once we do that, um, you want to take, take a step back and look at your patient, make sure that they're not overly exposed. So how would we make sure this patient who's in a hospital gown is not overly exposed? What do they need? Yeah, they need to be covered with something. Absolutely. If they're dressed, then they're covered. Right? But if they're in a gown, they need to be covered. All right. And um, finally, we're going to open the curtain. Okay. Um, one more thing that we want to do before we leave that patient, if they need something from us, how are we going to know? Okay. We can ask them, but what do we want to give them? The call light. Yeah, absolutely. I like to give my patients instructions on how to use it as well. Now, I know hours, days, weeks, I don't know. Um, but they're also not feeling well. Their mind is elsewhere. They're self-absorbed. They're probably tired, probably medicated. So when I give them the call light, I usually will say, just press that red button if you need anything. Okay. Um, once we've done all of that, we've got the patient's cooties all over us. What do we want to do with those cooties before we wa we leave the room? Wash, Wash our hands. Yeah, get rid of those cooties. Absolutely. The best place for them is down the drain. And then if we need to document, we do it after we wash our hands. That way we're not transferring pathogens to this pen that's going to go into your pocket and home with you at the end of the day. Um, but once you document, what do you need to do? Wash your hands again. Because remember, the big, bold, neon flashing sign here is to leave the patient with clean hands. So end the skill with clean hands. So it's the very last thing we do on every single skill. Now, I want you to read the care plan again before you tell the evaluator your skill is done. Because that way, you can make sure that you did everything the way you were supposed to, and you can make any corrections if you need to. Okay? Good? So you have to end the skill with clean hands, but you also have to end the skill with a patient that cares, feels cared for and cared about. So that's what a lot of the closing is about, right? A lot of the closing is verbal, not really action more verbal. Okay. You want to make sure the patient feels like we want to be there taking care of them. Not, 
Oh my gosh. Do you need anything else while I'm here? There's your call light. I got things to do. You know, that's not the, the impression that we have. You guys ever seen those CNAs out there? Oh yes. I've seen it. Lots of places. Absolutely. Well, we don't want to be that. We want to make sure our patient feels like we're there to take care of their needs, that they're not an imposition on us. You knew that I did yesterday. Say thank you to them. Because they, they're the reason you have a job, and that's really true. <laughs> absolutely. I thought about that. Yeah, I know I thank them for. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about hand sanitizer for a second, because this does come up. Let me show you Jeremy. This is my little Jeremy. Isn't he cute? Hand sanitizer. So in a clinical setting, you will have hand sanitizer available to you. Okay. Um, and hand sanitizer really is kind of the preferred um, decontamination method in most acute care clinical facilities, hospitals, rehabs, uh, same-day surgery centers. So you'll have these on the wall. They'll be by the elevator. They're, they're everywhere, right? Hand sanitizer. The problem is that most people don't know how to use them properly. Now, they sell hand sanitizer at Walmart and Bath and Body Works and all kinds of places. COVID made hand sanitizer like the end thing, right? You can even buy little holders for them and accessorize and all this stuff. The problem is that nobody ever really told you how to use it, you know? So what most of us do, we just take a little bit like this and we rub it together and then we're done. That did not work. When you are using hand sanitizer, you've got to get enough to make your hands, a little bit more, make your hands visibly wet. Visi do you see how wet that is? Visibly wet. And you've got to rub it for at least 20 seconds. Boy, where do we hear that before? Hand washing. So, and you've got to make sure you're getting all of those surfaces. So we usually neglect the back of our hands or down here or around the wrists, right? Those are all places that those pathogens can hide. So you've got to have your hands wet with hand sanitizer for at least 20 seconds for it to be effective. So when we're using hand sanitizer in clinical settings, we usually don't use enough. So we're killing some of the pathogens, but not all of them. And pathogens have the same type of immune system that we do. Now, this is really interesting. If you don't kill all of the pathogens, the ones that are left now have all of your secrets. They now can work on ways to get around them. How many of you guys have ever heard the term antibiotic resistance? So let me explain to you how this works. So let's say that we've got some bad guys out there that want to come in here and rob us, okay? And they're going to come through that door. And the first one that comes first through the door, you're near, so you're going to throw that water bottle at them. And that didn't do much. He ran away, but it didn't hurt him, didn't kill him. So he went out there and he told all the other robbers out there, hey, listen, when you go in, she's going to throw a water bottle at you. So Bob to the right. Okay. So the next one comes in and you're sitting there. You hit him over the head with your phone a couple times. Doesn't kill him. He runs outside and he tells everybody outside, hey, she's going to throw a water bottle. He's going to hit you in the head with a phone. So Bob right and then left. Okay. The next one that comes in, Bob's right, Bob's left, misses you two completely. You pick up your um, cup and you start jabbing at him with the straw and that doesn't do anything. So then he goes out and he tells all of them what to watch for. Now, the fourth one comes in and, and misses all of you guys because he knows what to avoid. You pick up that fire extinguisher and you bank, bonk him on the head really, really well and it kills him. Okay, so now he can't go out and tell anybody else about that because he's dead. Good. But they have our other secrets. Okay? They, they all know water bottle, phone, straw. They, they all know that. So those are no longer effective tools because they know about them. Make sense? Okay. When you use hand sanitizer or antibiotics, okay, and you don't kill all of those bacteria, the ones that are left, 
will know how to get around those defenses. And they live to tell others about it. And this is how we end up with antibiotic resistance. This is why when you get on antibiotics, they tell you to take every single one of them and you don't. You take enough till you feel better, right? But what you did is you lowered the um, bacterial count, but you didn't eliminate it, right? It's not, not enough bacteria to make you sick anymore, but they're still there. And now they know all about your secret weapon. And they're going to pass that on to other generations. Does that make sense? This is why they tell you to take all seven days because we're trying to make sure that we get every single last one of those so they don't live to tell the tale. Make sense? Okay. Now, there is something you need to know about hand sanitizer that's <coughs> really important. Hand sanitizer, um, does not work on two very specific types of um, pathogens. Oh, okay. Never seen that before. Two very specific types of pathogens. One of them is the norovirus. This is called the daycare disease or the cruise ship disease. And it gives you like usually 24 to 48 hours of very, very, very um, horrible diarrhea, nausea, you throw up, you can't get out of the bathroom, 24, 48 hours. It's really crappy. You've all had it. Okay. Um, but it spreads very quickly in a confined space like daycares and cruise ships that spreads very, very quickly. It does not get killed by hand sanitizer because it has a special coating around it that is resistant to hand it, it just The hand sanitizer doesn't work on it. So if you're caring for a patient with norovirus, don't use hand sanitizer. You need to use soap and water. The other one is way worse. The other one is C. diff. Now, C. diff is a spore, so it has a very hard shell around it that isn't penetrated by hand sanitizer. C. diff is same symptoms, right? Nausea, um, upset tummy severe diarrhea, but it lasts usually from six weeks to about three months. Yeah, yeah, it's horrible and it spreads super, super easy. So if we're dealing with patients with C. diff, we should not be using hand sanitizer. Good, make sense? This is like really gross stuff. C. diff is horrible. When to use hand sanitizer? Like we met with the patient, close the curtain, wash your hands. So do we use hand sanitizer when you're done? So you're going to go by your facility policy, wherever you go to work, what they tell you they want you to do. Okay. So if you're working in a hospital setting and your hands are not visibly soiled, like you haven't been working with body fluids, then you can use hand sanitizer instead of hand washing. So you walk in, you get some hand sanitizer, you close the curtain, you take your pulse, you open the curtain, use hand sanitizer, you can leave because your hands are not visibly soiled. You didn't contact any um, body fluids, right? Um, but you have to go by your facility policy, okay? If it were me personally, um, I'm washing my hands more than I'm using hand sanitizer. I was going to say you don't have that option, but I always choose to wash my hands. Well, sometimes you don't have time. Right? Yeah, sometimes you don't have time. And the other thing is that hand sanitizer is alcohol based. Well, it does dry out your, your hands. They usually have some lotions in them too to help. But soap and water is good because the pathogens go down the drain. I like that option. They're no longer on my hands. When I use hand sanitizer, it kills the pathogens, but where are they? Yeah, so, you know, if I'm going through the McDonald's drive through and ordering a large fry and I use hand sanitizer, I'm eating those fries with a side of dead E. coli, which isn't any more appetizing than live E. coli, right? So if I'm going to eat, drink, have my hands up near my face, I want them washed at the sink, cooties down the drain, not on my hands. That's what, you know, that's kind of my gold standard. 
But if I'm just, um, you know, taking vital signs, what's going on? I think you read your hand, like, movement. Oh. And gestures. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I got to work on a whole new thing here. <laughs> um, but if I'm... Um, if I'm going to be just doing something non-invasive with patients, then hand sanitizer is perfectly okay. The good thing about hand sanitizer, because it is alcohol-based, is it actually breaks down the shell around the pathogens. So soap and water washes them away, but um, hand sanitizer actually destroys them. So, you know, there's, there's good points to both of them, and that's why we want to go with our facility policy because your facility policy is going to be based on the types of patients that you're going to see in that facility. Okay, good. Questions? Okay. So we've mastered these three principles. Yay, good job. Good job. We got through all of them. So I told you we're going to learn 11 in this class, all the ones on the back wall, and we're already three down. Okay, so that means eight to go. And I'm going to feed them to you a little at a time as they're relevant to the skills that we're going to be working on. So we are going to learn a few more today. And then we'll learn some more next week. And then by the time we get into the third week, we're just going to recycle these same principles over and over and over and over and over again into different skills. Okay. So think of these principles as building blocks. So every skill we're going to do is going to start with the opening. Every skill we do will end with the closing. The care plan is going to tell us how or, you know, what we're supposed to be doing with that patient. It's going to um, tailor the skill to that patient. <coughs> so let's put them to work. Let's go to page 52. So the first thing that I want to point out to you on page 52 is right here along the side, this, um, what I call the vertical uh, principles listing right here. So we're going to follow the care plan. That never changes. We're going to do the opening. That never changes. We need to learn about glove rules in a minute. We're going to learn about pulse specific rules, and then we're going to do the closing. That never changes. So when you're looking at all 11, well, 12 when you count skills, skill specific, when you're looking at all of these, you can see what principles are going to be used in this skill. I've laid them out here for you so you can actually see the steps in each principle. So if you follow this, you will do the skill. Okay. So it's kind of a, a Cliff Notes version, a way of visualizing the skill very quickly. Each one of these puzzle pieces stands for a specific amount of steps. Good? Make sense? All right, I have a video for this, measure and record pulse. I also have test specific information down here. So if you look at the bottom, you can see somebody with your level of experience. That's none. <laughs> your level of experience should be able to complete this skill in five minutes or less. Somebody with your level of experience, you're taking a pulse. You should be able to do that in five minutes or less. Okay. This is, they give you way more time than you actually need here. Way more time. Because they know you're new and they know you're unsure and they know that you're probably not going to be all that quick about it. So I don't want you to rush through it. They give you way more time than you actually need. This is going to be done on another testing student. So somebody else that's there to test is going to be your patient. So you might be the patient for her to take a pulse on. Okay. That patient is going to be laying in bed. So if you're the patient, the evaluator is going to ask you to lay on your back in the middle of the bed, please. They're going to position you where you need to be. You don't need to know that. They're going to set the scene. Okay. Now, documentation is required for the skill. Anytime we count something, we have to write it down. So we're going to talk about documentation. 
And uh, normal values for a pulse are between 60 and 100. That's what's normal. For the test, you can be off by four beats in either direction. So let's say the evaluator got 76. If you got 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, or 80, you are accurate. That's a huge margin of error, guys. Huge. Okay. So let's get into how to take a pulse. We talked about these principles, right? This is how we're going to do the skill. Well, we already know skill rules. We already know the opening and we know the closing. I know that because we just reviewed them. So we need to learn about glove rules. And that's what we're going to focus on for the next hour is glove rules. Okay. And then we'll take a break. So I am going to pull up a chair because I'm getting a little short winded. And uh, we're going to talk about gloves. Now, I told you this is going to take me about an hour. It's, um, it would be so much easier on me if I just told you wear gloves for everything. Just put gloves on for everything, wear gloves for everything. Man, my lecture would be super quick, right? Wear gloves for everything. And that's what a lot of instructors do. They tell their students just wear gloves for everything in a clinical setting. But there's a really, really big problem with that. And I want to go over why that's a problem and why that's not a good strategy and what we really need to know about gloves, okay? And that's why I'm going to invest this hour in teaching you. Yes, it would be way quicker for me to say wear gloves for everything, but that's going to put both you and more importantly, the patient at risk. So in order to understand this, we're gonna talk about a scenario that has nothing to do with healthcare, but it's one that will help you understand this concept pretty quickly, okay? So what I'm gonna to talk to you about is starting on page 40. I do have a video on this. And we are going to evaluate whether we need gloves in every skill that we do. This is one of the big four. So these four principles apply to every single skill we do. We're going to follow the care plan, do our opening, evaluate for gloves, and do our closing. Doesn't matter what the skill is. So these four make up about one quarter to one half of every skill you do. One quarter to one half of every skill you do. Okay. So we got to learn them and we got to learn them really well. So let's talk about gloves. And you don't need to take notes. I did that for you. <laughs> Page 41 has all of your notes. But let's build a sandwich to explain how gloves work, okay? So have you ever gone to a place where you ordered a sandwich and you told them what you wanted on it and they built it right in front of you? They usually put on gloves when they do that, right? Why? Why do they put gloves on? Okay. You wouldn't want them touching that, that sandwich with their, ha their hands, would you? You probably wouldn't feel comfortable with that. It's a stranger. They're in a commercial kitchen. You want them to wear gloves. You, it makes you, you're standing there watching them, makes you feel very secure in the fact that they're wearing gloves. So let's walk through this. Okay. So I'm going to build the sandwich. You guys are going to help me by telling me what you want on the sandwich. <clears throat> so the first thing I'm going to do is put on my set of gloves. And I'm going to ask you, what kind of bread do you want? Wheat bread, please. Wheat bread. So I'm going to go over to the, the bread cart, and I'm going to pull the flap away, and I'm going to get the wheat bread out, bring it back over to the counter, and I'm going to pick up the knife that's sitting there, and I'm going to slice that wheat bread open and fold it, because you always have to kind of fold it open so that you can put the stuff in. Okay, and I'll put my knife down. All right, so we have um, cut our bread with the knife that was there. And uh, do we want some mayo on there? Okay, so I'm gonna, there, there's always that mayo spreader thing that's sticking out of the mayo. So I'm gonna pick that up and I'm gonna spread the mayo on the bread. And do you want any other sauces like mustard, honey mustard, honey mustard? 
So I'm going to get one of those honey mustard bottles and squirt that on there as well. And um, it's looking pretty good so far. Let's put some bacon on here. So I'm going to get the bacon package and we're going to put a couple slices of bacon on there. Sorry, guys, I forgot to turn my phone off. Okay, so we're going to put a couple slices of bacon on there. And now um, what kind of meat do we want? You want turkey, ham, chicken? chicken? Okay, so I'm going to get into that little cooler underneath the counter, and I'm going to get a package of chicken out, and we're going to lay that um, on the uh, on the sandwich. So uh, what kind of cheese would you like? Colby Jack. Colby Jack. So I'm going to open the cheese drawer, and oh, no, I'm out of Colby Jack. So let me go into the big cooler and get that. So I'm going to open up the big cooler, and I'm going to get into it and get the, um, the little um, – bins where the cheese is. I got to slice the cheese. So we're going to go over to the slicer and slice the cheese. And then I'm going to come back and um, put that on the sandwich. Um, let's toast this. Okay. Cause it's got bacon and cheese. And so we want to toast this, but somebody's using the toaster. So we're just going to stand there and wait for a second. And once it's our turn, I'm going to open the oven, put the sandwich in, turn the little dial, press the buttons. And when it dings, I'm going to grab that paddle and pull the sandwich out. I'm going to put it back on the counter. How about some toppings, lettuce? Yes. So I'm going to reach into the lettuce, grab some lettuce, and put it on the sandwich. Tomato? I'm going to get some tomato and put that on there. Olives, pickles, onions. Okay, so I'm going to get those toppings and put them on there as well. And uh, oil, vinegar, salt, pepper? Okay, so I'm going to grab those bottles and put that on there as well. And then I'm going to fold that sandwich up and I'm going to put it in the wrapper and give it to you. Now, you guys wanted me to wear gloves because you didn't want me to touch that sandwich. And I wore gloves, so I didn't touch the sandwich. But did that keep your sandwich clean? No. Why? Okay. So you're starting to see this. The problem is that when we wear gloves all the time, we stop paying attention to what we touch with those gloves. And in healthcare, that can be very dangerous, especially for our patients. So let's take a look at some of the things these gloves touch. And our question is, did those gloves really do what we thought those gloves were going to do? So we touched the outside of the bread cart, the knife. We touched the mayonnaise spreader, the sauce bottles, the outside of the bacon package, the cheese drawer, the door handle, the containers inside the cooler, the slicing machine, the table, when my hand was just kind of sitting there, uh, the toaster oven, the toaster oven controls, the paddle, the lettuce, tomato, and other toppings, the wrapper, and the list goes on. So most of those things are sitting there and they're not disinfect. You're not disinfecting lettuce, guys. Right? Most of those things are just sitting there. And that means that the potential for cross-contamination is there. Now, disclaimer here, guys. This was a real sandwich. I ate this sandwich and it was a very good sandwich. Your immune system needs to work out every once in a while. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with this sandwich. Don't stop eating sandwiches because of this. But I think that we need to pay a little bit more attention to what our gloves are touching if we're going to wear them. It's a good illustration. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Now, thankfully, I have a good immune system. Not today, but usually. <laughs> I have a good immune system. So even though I may have ingested a few pathogens because of everything that was touched, it's okay because my immune system is relatively healthy and can fight it off. But if my immune system is currently busy because I'm sick, like today, then I probably don't want to bring another pathogen to the party because my immune system may not be able to fight two wars at the same time. Does that make sense? So in a clinical setting, our patients are already fighting a war. 
we want to be very careful about what we reintroduce them to as far as pathogens. So this um, concept becomes a little bit more complex than just wear gloves for everything. And I've seen this a million times in my career. I see it on TV. I watch Discovery Health. And my husband, I drive him crazy because I'm like, don't touch that. And the TV can't hear me, you know. Um, but it's we see this all the time. Nurses will come in the room. They'll close the curtain. They'll um, put a, a dressing on a wound. And then they'll pour the patient a cup of water and hand it to them. And they're thinking about the gloves as protecting them, not the patient. But those gloves really need to protect the patient as well as us. Does that make sense? So we kind of have to tweak our thinking when it comes to gloves. It's not just enough to protect you. You're washing your hands before you touch the patient. And you're washing your hands after you touch the patient. So where are all those cooties going? down the drain. They're not a danger to you. Does that make sense? But if you wear gloves routinely and you start touching a whole bunch of stuff and then give those pathogens to the patient, they have no way of getting rid of them. So the person really at risk here is the patient. Does that make sense? Hold on. Hold, I, I'm probably going to get where you're going. Just give me a minute. All right. So healthcare workers work in environments with lots of pathogens, right? That's what we do. That's where people with pathogens go. So we already know our patients have a lot of pathogens. It's a pathogen-rich environment. And you guys are sitting there thinking, well, who's going to protect me? I don't want to get sick, right? So in order to understand this, we have to talk about something called the chain of infection. So we have to learn how infections are spread in order to learn how to prevent them from not just our patients, but also from affecting us. So this is, everything I'm about to tell you is on page 123. So what I'm going to teach you now is a fifth grade version of this concept. It is way, way, way more complex than this. But the way I'm going to present it to you is what you really need to understand in order to work in healthcare. Okay. Those of you who go on to be infection control specialists will be able to give, you know, four hour dissertations on this. That's not what I'm going to go over. Okay. We're going to really simplify this down. But the chain of infection has to start with a pathogen, right? No pathogen, no problem. If you don't have hepatitis B, you can't give it to anybody else. No pathogen, no problem. So our chain of infection always starts with a pathogen. So this is where COVID got mixed up in the very beginning because it was a new pathogen. And we didn't know all of the steps. Let's go back a slide here. We didn't know all of these steps. We have to work with it a while to figure all this out, right? It's, they don't come with a set of instructions. So new pathogen, a whole new set of problems. We got to work it out. So when you have a pathogen, um, the first thing that we need to know is where does that pathogen live? Does it live on surfaces? Does it live in the air? Does it live in body fluids? Does it live in um, vectors like mosquitoes and rats and things like that? Where does it live, right? And the good thing about pathogens is most of the time, they don't live outside very well. They need to be inside. They're kind of inside pets, right? They don't do well outside. In fact, most pathogens won't last more than a couple of hours outside of a host. So, um, but this is where we really kind of got mixed up with COVID because we didn't know. We didn't know. And it was spreading so rapidly, we thought, well, maybe this is one of those rare ones that kind of live on surfaces. Now, those are really rare. 
but they had us wiping down our ketchup bottles, right? Because they didn't know, right? We're, 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 new pathogen, new problem. We don't know. So let's be safe and wipe everything off because we just don't know, okay? Now, after some time, they told us, yeah, you can quit doing that. You don't need to do that anymore. Um, because we learned that, okay, COVID, yeah, it doesn't live outside the body very long, just like most other pathogens, cool. Um, so now we got to know, well, what kind of host does it require? Since it doesn't live outside, that means it's got to be inside something. So what is the something, right? And is it just humans or is it humans and other animals or is it humans and vectors? You know, what, where does it live, right? So we call these reservoirs or hosts. And it turns out that COVID-19 likes humans. It sets up shop there very nicely. Humans have everything that it needs, like the Goldilocks scenario. Um, and as long as it's inside the host, it's happy, right? It's got a whole living room set up. It's very, very happy living inside its host. And in fact, it's so happy, it really, really doesn't want to go anywhere. It just wants to kind of stay because it's a good environment. So the body doesn't want it there. The body's like, yeah, you got to go. You don't belong. So the body, you guys ever have a house guest that stayed a little longer than you wanted? Right. So you tend to give little hints that you're done right? You might slam some doors. You might give them the silent treatment. Maybe you uh, turn up the thermostat a little bit. Um, you know, you give them little hints that, hey, it's time to go. Well, that's actually what your body does when it has a pathogen it doesn't want hanging around. That's what a fever is. Your body turns up the thermostat to make the body a not so pleasant place for the pathogen to hang out. And hopefully it leaves. You cough and sneeze to push the pathogen out of the body. So your body will do things to get rid of the pathogen. Um, and we call those symptoms. So me, I have a cough and a runny nose. Those are symptoms. That's my body's way of trying to push the pathogen out of the body. Make sense? Okay. Um, but the pathogen really does need to be kind of pushed out. It doesn't go on its own. It's happy there. So that means that, um, well, let me get there. Okay. It's got to find a doorway out. And it's probably going to have to have a little help because it's not going to go on its own. Okay. So doorways are any wet body opening in your body. So your eyes, right? Your eyes, wet stuff can come out. That's a doorway. It lets stuff out. It can also let stuff in. Anything that lets stuff out can also let stuff in, okay? So your nose, that's a doorway. Your mouth, that's a doorway. Your genitals, that's a doorway. Your rectal area is a doorway. Wounds, rashes, sores, incisions. Any area of the body that lets wet stuff out is a doorway. Make sense? That's the only way that this guy can get out. Skin, that's not a doorway. So it's like this wall here, okay? Your skin is just like a wall. Nothing can get through that wall. Your pathogens don't have jackhammers and drills, and they don't come with heavy equipment. So they can't get through the skin. Starting to see that real quick. They have to get out through a wet body opening. So wet body openings are what we call doorways. Eyes, nose, mouth, genitals, rectal area, wounds, rashes, sores, and incisions. This is an important concept for you. And like I said, I'm really, really, really simplifying this. It's a little more complex than this. But I need you to understand that pathogens don't get through the skin. 
So I can reach out and touch you and there's no pathogen there. Okay. That even if you have pathogen on your skin and I touch it, there's no way for that pathogen to get in me unless I bring it to a doorway. Now, if I reach out and touch you and you have HIV on your skin and then I eat a hamburger without washing my hands, now that HIV can get in through my mouth. Okay, make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, but it can't drill through the skin. I have a question about the fever part of it. So you said that your body will naturally turn up the heat to try and make it uncomfortable and get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So if that's kind of good for you then, then why will doctors always tell you to take ibuprofen or Motrin to keep the fever down. Okay. Okay. So yes, they will tell you to take ibuprofen or Motrin to keep the fever down if it's over. Uh, right. Okay. Right. If it's over 101.5, usually for adults, they'll tell you to take something to, to knock it down a little bit. A little warm is okay. Too warm, we start melting the plastic in the house. <laughs> So yes, they, a, a low grade fever is actually a good way of your body trying to fight an infection. And we try not to treat that whenever possible, unless it gets a little too high. Right. Because we don't want to melt our plastic brain. <laughs> okay, good. All right. The thing that you need to understand is that pathogens don't have feet and they don't have wings. They don't move around on their own. They can't. They are static. They sit where they sit. They don't move. Pathogens have to have a way to get around. Now, in most cases, it's either going to be in fluid or on particles in the air. They have to hitch a ride. They don't have a car of their own. They have to hitch a ride. So most pathogens are going to flow through fluid. So remember all of your doorways? Remember I said wet body openings? Because it requires fluid to get out and around. Pathogens don't have feet. HIV sitting there on that table, not a danger to me at all. It can't fly over here. It can't crawl over here. Pathogens have no mode of transmission. Now, if I walked over there and touched the pathogen, now it becomes real to me. But it didn't get here on its own. Does that make sense? So anything that floats or flows is probably where your pathogens are going to be located. So if we have somebody who has a respiratory infection and starts coughing, pathogens don't have wings. They can't fly around, okay? What they're going to do is travel on particles in that cough. So little bitty tiny droplets of saliva or bronchial fluid, okay? Um, there are four pathogens that travel through the air. Four. You don't need to know which four. They're um, highly virulent. They spread very, very quickly. And we thought COVID was one of them, which is why everybody wore a mask. Okay. But after we got to know COVID a little bit better, we realized that it doesn't fly through the air. And by the way, Things that are airborne, they actually don't fly through the air. They are on dust particles in the air. They still have to hitch a ride. Okay? But they're microscopic. So they go further. The wind can kind of take them, just like wind takes dust particles. You know? So they're not heavy, so they float, but they still hitch a ride on dust particles. Okay? So pathogens have to have a way to get around. Either on stuff suspended in the air or in liquid, but they don't fly on their own. Okay, good. So if we have something that is flying through the air and we don't want to breathe it in, well, covering our holes would be a good first step, right? 
right? And then we realized that, oh, okay, once we got to know the pathogen, hey, it's not as little as we thought it was. You know, it's not as light as we thought it was. So it's probably not hanging out on dust particles in the air. It's not spreading quickly. It's on droplets. Now, droplets are heavier. So that means that they only go out maybe three or four feet and then they fall because they're heavy. So this is things that, you know, you sneeze out or you cough out. It's going to be like right in this area, but not way back there. Make sense? Okay. So there's lots of ways for pathogens to get around. But when it's a new pathogen, we don't know. We haven't been introduced yet. We haven't gotten to know it really well. It's kind of like a blind date. Got to see how it goes. Get to know you a little, right? And then once we get to know it, then we can start formulating our defenses against it. But in the very beginning, we're like, okay, we don't know anything about this. So let's put up all of our defenses until we know a little bit more. Make sense? And then we can start backing those defenses off as we learn a little bit more about the pathogen. Okay. Make sense? Okay. So first we have to have a pathogen. That pathogen has to have a place to live. It's happy there. So it has to be forced out either through a cut, a wound, a sore, whatever. And then it has to have a way to get around either particles in the air or fluid that's flowing. Okay. So we're halfway through our chain of infection. But that's all on the patient side of things. Now let's talk our side. Okay. Just like the patient, the pathogens can't get out of the skin, pathogens can't get into our skin. Okay. So if we get a pathogen on us, as long as our skin is intact, not a big deal because it can't drill in, it can't burrow, it doesn't have any heavy equipment. Okay. It has to come in through a doorway. Angel says, I have an elderly patient that is easily aggravated at the house. How many times do we show them how to use the call button? Um, Angel, that's or at the hospital. Yeah, I would, um, I would talk to the nurse that's caring for that patient to get specific uh, instructions on that patient, the best way to handle that patient. Um, that's unfortunately not something I, I can't give you specifics because I don't know that patient at all. Okay, so a pathogen that's in a patient that's forced out through a cut, a sore, a sneeze, a cough, something like that, and is now out in the wild. Remember, it can't fly on its own. It can't walk anywhere. It's got to travel on air currents or droplets or body fluids. However, if we come into contact with any of those things, that pathogen has to have a way into us. So those same body openings, eyes, nose, mouth, genitals, rectal area, wounds, rashes, sores, and incisions, those same wet body openings can let pathogens in, okay? So if I have, I have a brand new puppy. Oh, he's adorable. He's three weeks old. I love him to pieces. Absolutely love him. My puppy gave birth. <laughs> so I have a one-year-old puppy who now has a puppy. Um, we actually have an Instagram channel for her, for them. It's amazing. Uh, they're so cute. But he's got very sharp claws because he's a three-week-old puppy, right? So I was playing with him a couple of days ago. And I mean, his claws are pretty sharp. Now, he didn't, he didn't, um, I got a couple little marks here. He didn't get me too bad, but um, I would imagine over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to have some scratches on my arms right? So that is now an opening in my skin. And that would allow pathogens to be able to come in. So what could I maybe do if I know I've got an extra opening that might be near pathogens? What could I do in a clinical setting? Cover it. Sure. So cover your holes, guys. Right? Don't let stuff from other people's holes into your holes. Yes, that covers everything. 
Don't let stuff from other people's holes into your holes. That is how you keep from getting infected. Okay, cover your holes. So, if we understand that pathogens have a place to live, they're forced out through wet body openings, they have to have a way to travel, they don't travel on their own, and then they have to have a doorway to get into you, there's a lot of steps there that have to happen in order for you to get infected, okay? But we're not done yet. There's still another step here. If the pathogen can't find a doorway to get into, it dies because it doesn't live outside, okay? So pathogens on surfaces don't live very long. They have to have a way of getting in. So here's the problem. Here is the problem. One, two, three, four. Okay, half of you right now have your hands up near your face. And you probably didn't even realize it. Right? Our hands do things without our permission all of the time. And usually that means putting them up here around our face. You know, we'll pick up our phone, talk on it. We'll sit like this. We'll move hair out of our face. We'll scratch our noses. We do things up here without thinking about it all of the time. And remember, most of the body openings on your body are here in your face. So we have to be very, very mindful of what our hands are doing when we're working in healthcare. Okay. That is how most infections happen. It's not because the pathogens are getting through your skin. In most cases, you're not breathing them in because remember, there's only four that travel through the air. That's not how you're getting infected. You're getting infected because you're putting your hands up near your face. Now, clearly, I have done that in the recent past. I am sick. That is how I got sick. Okay. Means a pathogen got in through one of my open doorways. Make sense? Make sense? Okay. But remember, if they can't find a doorway in, no problem. So covering your doorways is a good way to prevent infection. But if they do get in, okay, if they find an open area and they're able to invade, then that you have to be susceptible. So remember we talked a few minutes ago about pathogen resistance, right? So the first guy came in, you hit him with a water bottle. He went back and told everybody else. Second guy comes in, you uh, hit him with a phone. He goes back and tells everybody else. You guys remember that? That's how our immune system works too. So if the pathogen that invaded me, if I had seen that pathogen before, and I had instructions on how to kill it, then um, I wouldn't have gotten sick. So when a pathogen invades, you have certain cells in your body that are like little secretaries, and they carry around this filing cabinet with them everywhere they go. And when a pathogen invades, it goes through its little filing cabinet and says, hey, do, have we seen this guy before? Do we have the recipe on how to kill him? And it looks, and in the meantime, while it's looking, you're getting symptoms, but it looks, 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 and it says, yes, I have the instructions. Look at that. This is how we kill them. Okay. We took, what did we take the, how did we kill our pathogen before? Fire, fire, extinguisher. fire extinguisher. Okay. So grab that fire extinguisher, bash it over the head a couple times, kill the pathogen, no problem. And then we overcome the pathogen and don't get sick. Okay. But if my little secretary, white blood cell, goes through his filing cabinet and says, nope, never seen this guy before. We're new. Well, now we got to start all over. We're going to start with the water bottle. That doesn't work. We'll go to the phone. That doesn't work. We'll go to the straw. That doesn't work. We'll go to the fire extinguisher. That didn't work because it's a different pathogen. So now we're on to uncharted territory. In the meantime, you're getting sick, symptoms, because that pathogen isn't being killed and it's just making little copies of itself. Okay. 
Make sense? So that's how uh, it happens. Like, for example, during COVID, that people in the same house, one of them had COVID, but the other person, like, didn't. Yeah. Right. They were, they were probably not susceptible, mm -hmm. which means their immune system was able to overcome the invader pretty quickly. But COVID is unusual mm -hmm. because COVID will actually cause an infection without symptoms. So there are a lot, there are millions of people who had COVID who have no idea that they've had it because COVID is sneaky. COVID is really it's a very, they're, they're going to be studying COVID for years because it's a very unique um, pathogen. COVID can invade your cells and it has, it has a um, kind of like a stealth mode. Okay. So a whole, let, let me explain a virus real quick. This is way off topic. When a virus invades you, that virus doesn't do anything on its own. That virus invades a cell and then it hijacks your cell's nucleus and it injects its RNA, half of DNA, into your cell's nucleus. And what it does is it turns off that cell for working for you. It hijacks it. And now it becomes a virus making factory itself. So viruses actually invade your cell and they change your DNA. And then it cranks out a whole bunch of other viruses, more copies. Those all, as the cell erupts, spread out, find new cells to invade, hijack your nucleus, and creates more. Okay. Now, all of that is happening inside your body while your defenses are trying to figure out how to kill it. So this is happening at the same time. So you're getting symptoms. Your body's trying to figure out how to kill it, and it's just a race to the finish line. Whoever gets to the finish line first wins, right? So normally when you get infected, you get symptoms, right? I have a runny nose. I've got a scratchy throat. I've got a cough, tired. I have symptoms, right? And that tells me I'm sick. That tells me I have a virus inside my cell. The vi Remember, the virus doesn't do anything. All the virus does is invade cell and makes copies. The virus doesn't make me sick. My body does. Because it's trying to kick it's trying to kick the virus out. Okay? Does that make sense? COVID is unique because it can invade, it can get into your cells and it can do so under the radar. So your body doesn't know it's there. So it's not fighting. Right. It can be a problem. Yes. So it, it could have been that that family member that was not feeling very sick from or did not pass COVID during the other family member was having a miserable time. So maybe that one could have passed. Sure. Absolutely. Yep. Wow. Absolutely. Yep. So COVID is very unique in that it has that stealth ability. Not very many viruses have that. Most viruses, when they invade, your body says, hey, you don't belong here. Okay. But think of it like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay. Now remember, viruses invade and they plug into your DNA. So it can fundamentally change. Um, anybody ever hear about chicken pox? Anybody ever hear chicken pox? Okay. Have you ever heard of shingles? Okay. So if you have chicken pox when you're a kid, when you're in your 60s, 70s, you can get shingles. That means that that virus is still in your body. It's still plugged into those nerve cells. And it can reawaken, reactivate later in life and cause shingles. That's right. That is correct. So understanding all, remember, I'm, I'm trying to, to boil this down to a fifth grade level, right? But it's a really, really big topic. So when we had COVID that showed up and we know that COVID invades the cells, COVID alters the DNA, we don't know how it's spread. And we don't know the long-term effects. Because like chicken pox, polio, 
and other viruses, the effects can reactivate decades later. So polio can reactivate too. Absolutely. Something called post-polio syndrome. Mm -hmm. So if you'd had the vaccination for it, that, that could still... The vaccination prevented the original infection. Okay. But you could still get... No. No. No, you would have to have the infection to get post-polio syndrome. Okay. The vaccine prevented the infection. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. So when COVID showed up and everybody was, um, okay, we don't know how this spreads. We know that it could potentially affect us decades later. We want to try to prevent as much people as possible from getting it. That's why all of those standards were enacted right away and then back down as we learn more about the virus. And does COVID have something to do with the brain? Too? Like the, I heard, I've been hearing that. And okay, so let me, ex and I don't want to get too terribly off topic here, right. but let me explain something really quickly. Every virus has a preferred cell. Okay. So chicken pox affects the nerve cells. Um, the virus I have affects the, um, endothelial cells, you know, the sinuses, you know, yeah. Um, herpes affects um, a specific type of skin cell, okay? Uh, hepatitis affects the liver cells. So every virus has a specific flavor type of cell it likes, okay? The problem with COVID is its cell that it likes is what we call endothelial cells that lines your every part of your body. So the inside of your alveoli in your lungs, your bronchial, you, the covering on your brain, your um, uh, the coating on the muscles. So it affects endothelial cells, which is probably the worst case scenario because endothelial cells are, are throughout your body. Okay. Where hepatitis, it's pretty easy. It affects liver cells. Those are only found in one place, right? COVID doesn't do that. It affects, so that's why we have heart problems, and brain problems. Right. Right. Okay. That's pretty nasty. Yeah. So we wanted to try to prevent as many people as possible from coming into contact with it, at least until we can learn a little bit about it to figure out how to treat it. Okay. Make sense? Okay. So you have to be susceptible. If you've come into contact with that, or if you've had a vaccine like polio, if you had the polio vaccine, your immune system can now recognize polio. As soon as it invades, it says, hey, we know how to kill you. It pulls that out, kills polio, no infection. So does the vaccine mean they actually put a little bit of that virus in the vaccine? So what it does, it, it, vaccines, there, there's a couple different ways of doing it. Okay, there's live vaccines, there's attenuated vaccines. Um, live vaccines means that's exactly what it is. We give you a very, very, very small dose of that virus so your body can recognize it. Live vaccines usually get a reaction. Attenuated vaccine means that we take that vac that virus and we kill it, but leave it intact. So we put that in you. So your body will recognize it, but it's not alive. It can't infect you. And then there's the new types of vaccines where we don't give you the virus because that's a little risky, actually. So the new vaccines that they have coming out now. They don't inject the virus, live or dead, doesn't matter. What they inject is the wanted poster. Hey, this is what the virus looks like. Yeah. It's like when you used to go to the post office, they had the wanted posters on the wall. This is who we're looking for. So it's a safer way of introducing your body, but not just the wanted poster. It also gives the body step-by-step -step instructions on how to kill it. Okay. Problem with COVID is it is a master of disguise. It has boxes of hair dye and facial reconstruction and 
we can give the body the wanted poster, but COVID next week isn't going to look like that. So, so it's able to change itself. Absolutely. All viruses do. All viruses mutate. That is the constant of viruses. All viruses mutate. Some mutate faster than others. COVID is a speedy, speedy mutate. Some are stable mutators. The flu is a stable mutator. Every year, the flu is a little bit different. It changes a little bit. That's why we have to have yearly flu shots, because it changes just a little bit. But we can stay ahead of it because it's a stable change. COVID? Mm. No, it, it changes rapidly. So that's why people getting the vaccine, a lot of times looking back with COVID because it wasn't able to right. stop it. Right, because it, the COVID mutated too quickly. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> now, thankfully, and I'm very, very thankful for this, mutation can go one of two ways. It can make it more dangerous or less dangerous. Thankfully, our COVID is going on the less dangerous route. We don't know when that's going to change. I heard of a lot of elderly people that got that vaccination, but they ended up dying from it. Maybe, maybe they weren't, maybe they didn't really die from that, but something else. I don't know. It seemed like a lot of elderly people. That so knew. correlation is not causation. Okay. So we, we have to be really careful about drawing a straight line. Right. Between the two. Right. So, um, a great example of that, yeah. right? I'm sick right now. Right. And I have heard that if you drink Wendy's Frosties, it makes you sick. Because I know somebody who had a Wendy's Frosty and got sick. Well, I had a Wendy's Frosty last week. So, maybe that's what caused this. Do they really have anything to do with one another? No. Probably not. So you just have to kind of be careful. Right? So when, you, when you're drawing correlations, right. just because two things look like they might be related right. doesn't necessarily mean they are. They could be. Right. I'm not saying that they're not. Right. No, but you, 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 be you've got to be careful about making those associations. Right. And it seemed like people that had other complications were the ones that were more susceptible. Sure, because remember, their their immune system is already, is already stri okay. fighting another war. Okay. Okay. So when we're elderly, yeah. right, yeah. our immune systems are already worn out. Right. And they're not as effective as they used to be. Right. And they're probably fighting different um, pathogens that we just get from Walmart and Winn-Dixie and other right. places, right? So when you add on to that something else, right. it could just be the tipping point. Right. Okay. So it may not be the vaccine right. that caused, but the vaccine may have been a contributing right. factor. Right. We don't know. Yeah. And it's honestly way too soon to know. Yeah. Like I said, they'll be studying this for eons. Yeah. Eons. Right. Okay. So you have to be susceptible. Remember, a, a, a vaccine is just an instruction manual for your immune system to be able to recognize a pathogen and learn how to kill it. But there is no substitute for good old-fashioned experience. Okay, I can tell you how to drive a car, but until you actually drive a car, you don't really know how to drive a car. Okay. So vaccines are good. They provide information. But the best immunity, the best, the, the most um, effective immunity is going to come when your body defeats a pathogen. Okay. Right. So having a healthy immune system allows your trained white blood cells to be able to kill the pathogens and prevent infections. But if your immune system can't, and you get infected, you are now a host. But you guys see how much we have to go through just to get infected? Do you guys see all those steps? 
Now, there's a lot of things that we can do as healthcare workers to help prevent this from occurring. Okay. And gloves are one of those things, but they're just one. And gloves are not the magic suit of armor you think they are. First of all, pathogens don't live on surfaces very long. Okay. Short amount of time, a couple hours maybe. Um, but most of the time, pathogens have to be in a host to be living. So we have to keep that in mind. So since pathogens generally travel in fluids, as long as you're not touching body fluids, you're not really encountering live pathogens. Okay, good. So you can touch patient skin. You can touch surfaces. Remember, you're going to wash your hands before and after. That's right. And I think they need our touch. I mean, the patients. Sure, need patients touch. need the touch. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But this is also how you keep your immune system mm -hmm. in healthy working order because you encounter pathogens every day. Guys, they hang out on the ketchup bottles. You encounter them every day. And you need a certain amount of pathogens to keep your immune system healthy, working. It's like a workout. So it's only when a pathogen leaves a, a host or a reservoir through an open doorway, travels to another host, gets in through an open doorway, and that host is susceptible, does an infection happen? A lot of steps there. But now that person is a host. So when it comes to preventing the spread of infection, don't let stuff from other people's holes into yours. It really is that simple. And this is where PPE, or personal protective equipment, is going to come in because it's going to help prevent pathogens from getting into any of your doorways. But if we don't use it properly, then we can introduce pathogens to the patient's doorways. And that's why we want to be careful with gloves. Okay? Does that make sense? Remember that we are not the only ones at risk. In fact, we don't even have the biggest risk in the room. Okay. So when we think about patient care environments, remember your patient is already under the weather with whatever it is that brought them in here. Either they're sick or they have an injury or they have a chronic disease, but their immune system already working over time. They're in a pathogen rich environment. So if they get something, it's because we gave it to them. They're not crawling into bed together. They're not playing bridge together. Okay. So since you're pretty healthy and your immune system is on standby and the patient is ill or injured, their immune system is busy, that's what puts the patient more at risk. So learning how to use gloves properly is um, super important here. All right. So if you remember what we do, right? ADLs, activities of daily living. Bathing, that puts us around patients' body openings. Dressing, puts us around patient body openings. Grooming, mouth care, around body openings. Toileting, around body openings, right? We are around body openings all day, every day. So this is particularly important for us to understand because we, CNAs, are usually where patients get infections from because we're working around their body opening. Sure, nurses are working around incisions and wounds, but we provide way more care than the nurses do. Got it? So this is really important for us to understand. So since we provide personal care like bathing, feeding, mouth care, dental care, peri care, catheter care, and toileting, we have lots of opportunity to introduce pathogens into our patients. Doorways out, you mean doorways in. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the gloves. Yes, we are going to wear gloves. We're going to wear them when it's appropriate, and we're going to wear them the right way. And they are an extra layer of protection. So remember that pathogens need to float or flow 
to get around. If we're going to be working around any of the patient's body fluids, anything wet, we want an extra layer of protection. Remember that your hands go up near your face all the time without thinking about it? Well, when you have gloves on, it makes you think twice. Okay, So it just kind of is a reminder, hey, don't put your hands up here. All right. Um, anytime we might come into contact with body fluids, personal skin, or non-intact skin, we're going to wear gloves. So if I'm going to do mouth care, I need gloves. If I'm going to do peri care below the belt, I need gloves. If I'm going to take a pulse, I'll need gloves. As long as the patient's skin is intact. Now, if they've got a three-week-old puppy at home and they've got a great big scratch on their arm that I'm going to take a pulse on, now I'm going to wear gloves because there is a, an opening there, a doorway. Make sense? Okay. So body fluids, anything wet and sticky that's not yours. Personal skin, anything normally covered by a bathing suit or non-intact skin wounds, rashes, sores, or incisions. We need an extra layer of protection, gloves. But if we're going to wear those gloves, um, we have to have some rules, okay? The problem is that you can't tell by looking at somebody whether they have an infection. You just can't tell. You might be sitting there with HIV and you don't know it yet because you haven't had any symptoms. You haven't been tested. So you may be harboring something that you don't even know about. And if you don't know about it, how am I going to know about it, right? We don't have magic machines that we can put you in that'll tell you everything that's wrong with you. Man, I wish they did. It made my life a whole lot easier. But we don't. So you can't tell by looking at somebody whether they're sick. So we're going to use this rule with everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. If I'm going to touch your body fluids, your personal skin, or your non-intact skin, we're going to wear an extra set of gloves. But it's for you as well as for me. Okay, good. This is called standard precautions because we use it with everybody. My son, when he was 17 years old, my oldest one, he was helping um, his stepdad take down some stuff and they were a couple hours away and um, a piece of metal shelving fell on his leg and it, it scraped his skin all the way down to the, on his, his ankle. And my husband called me up. What do I do? I said, go get this stuff, bring them home. You wrap it up, bring them home. I'll take a look. When he got home, I put gloves on. He's like, mom, why are you putting gloves on? I'm your son. I said, yes, but this is for your protection as well as mine. You don't want me to introduce anything into that wound. But it's also because you're 17 and you've been out of my sight for more than 15 minutes. <laughs> and I don't know what's gotten into any of your holes. So we're going to wear gloves. Okay. That's how serious this is. Okay. Good. Is he okay then? Injected oh, yeah, no. Stuff. He's fine. Yeah. yeah, we got him. He's got a scar, but he's small. He's yeah, fine. He survived. <laughs> he survived. They're, they're tough kids. They had to be. Yeah, right. All right. So, standard precautions means we're going to use these rules with everyone, not just those that look sick. Anytime we're going to touch body fluids, personal skin, or non-intact skin, we're going to wear some gloves. All right. This is a good way for you to remember. And, you know, the, the three rules are good. Body fluids, personal skin, non-intact skin. But if you just kind of boil that down to doorways, are you going to be around doorways? If you're going to be around any doorways, then you need gloves. But if we're going to wear gloves, we have to have some rules. And our number one rule here is that the first thing those gloves should touch is the patient, not the environment. Remember, if you touch that bed and then you touch a body opening, whatever was on that bed is going to go into that wound or that opening. Remember, the doorway's in. So we want to make sure that we get all of our supplies prepped before we put our gloves on. And that's going to be the hardest part of gloves for you. It is the hardest part. Because most people want to start the skill, do their opening, put their gloves on, and then do the skill. 
go get your supplies, prep your supplies, get your patient ready. If you do that, you've contaminated those gloves with everything that you've touched before you ever get to the patient. Okay. Uh, Laika says, when you apply for the exam in Florida, how long do they take to call you? They don't call you. They're going to email you with your test date. And um, your first email will come in three days. The second email will come in about seven to 10 days with your test date, as long as you're approved for testing. So if you haven't heard back from Prometric from the time that you register, if you don't have your test date within 10 business days, you need to call them. All right. And then, oops. Sorry, I forgot. Um, you have to pay attention to what your dirty gloves have touched so that you don't contaminate the other surfaces in the room. And you want to remove those soiled gloves correctly. And that's what we're going to learn to do in just a moment. Um, let's go ahead and take our break, though. Okay. And then when we get back from break, we're going to do an experiment on how to remove our gloves. This is very good.
So any questions on gloves? Any questions on gloves? Um, if the last thing we touch is, or if we take our gloves off after everything and we're not touching anything else, why do we wash our hands before we leave the room? Okay, we're going to talk about that right now. Yeah, <laughs> no, that that's good. That's good. We're good, but that's um. So this slide right here will tell you it is going to start that right. Gloves are not the magic suit of armor you think they are. A lot of people think, okay, I'm wearing gloves, I'm protected, everything is good. That's actually not. Oh. Hold on a minute. I I went over there and I forgot to get it. Hold on one second. Can I get you there? Is it on your desk? What's that? Is there something on your desk? No, no, I, I've got to have Jake bring me something yeah. here. While I'm talking. Okay. All right. So we tend to think when we put gloves on that it's protecting us. And it does provide some protection, but not the amount of protection you think it does. And in order to illustrate this, we're going to talk about balloons. So these balloons, these types of balloons, you've seen these, right? Birthday balloons, they kind of fill them with helium. They pop up against the ceiling. Um, what happens to those balloons after a couple of days? Right. They shrink. They, they lose air in there. They deflate, right? So how does that happen, right? Because... It's the balloon is made out of latex, same thing gloves are made out of. So if we put helium in and then somehow it deflates, how does that happen? Well, it happens because latex is a man-made material and it has holes in it. And over time, these helium molecules are able to wiggle out through these holes. So when you have latex and we inflate the balloon, with helium, it stretches that fabric, which makes the holes a little bit bigger. And it does hold the helium in for a while, but over time, those helium molecules are able to wiggle through. Okay, So that tells us that latex has holes. And so does vinyl and so does nitrile. That They all have microscopic holes in them. So if helium can get out, pathogens can get in, okay? And they've done a million um, studies on this, right? They've had healthcare workers wash their hands really well, put gloves on, do a procedure, and then they culture the hands after you take the gloves off and every time pathogens grow. Okay. So gloves are not the suit of armor that you actually think they are. They help reduce the amount of pathogens on your skin, but they do not eliminate the amount of pathogens. Does that make sense? Okay. So remember that when we, there's two things that affect this, okay? Just like the balloon, time and stretch was going to affect this. So if you are wearing gloves that are super small and you really have to stretch them, that's providing way less protection for you because those holes are getting bigger. Um, the amount of time you wear gloves is going to affect this as well. The longer you're wearing the gloves, the more pathogens are going to get through. So we want to wear the gloves when it's appropriate, but for the shortest amount of time that it's appropriate. Okay, make sense? Yeah, you probably didn't think about that, did you? Here's another problem with gloves. And this was probably even worse. Have you ever worn gloves? Yes. Like for cleaning or whatever? What does it make your hands do? Sweat. 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 Okay, so inside the glove, right, the surface of your hand is now warm because of the body heat, dark, because the glove and moist because of sweat. So any pathogens that got through are now in the ideal breeding environment. 
And pathogens don't need little boy bacteria, little girl bacteria to make baby bacteria. Doesn't work like that. All pathogens need are the right ingredients. They zip themselves in half and make two. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So um, when we have gloves on and it creates that warm, dark, moist environment, and we know that pathogens got through the gloves, that means that those pathogens are going to proliferate. There's going to become more than just what got through the gloves, right? Anybody ever go to like one of these big, when well, they used to have cashiers, one of the big box stores and you saw a little old lady that's, you know, ringing people out and they had the gloves on, right? So they're working a four hour shift before lunch. They've got these gloves on. They don't want to touch your ketchup bottle and they're ringing everybody out. And then they get done with their shift and they're getting ready to go on break and they take those gloves off and they don't wash their hands because they think to themselves, well, I didn't touch the ketchup bottle. I'm good. Well, they probably are at, and not probably, they are at way more risk because we've had time and we've had stretch and we've got all of those pathogens on the inside of the gloves. So by wearing gloves and not washing, thinking that now I don't have to wash my hands, they're at way more risk. So that tuna salad sandwich is going to come with a side of E. coli. <laughs> yeah. What's that? Okay. So uniforms are not considered clean once you start work. We're going to talk about that too. Uniforms are not considered clean once you start work. All right, so remember the inside of the glove is the ideal environment for pathogens. So when we take our gloves off, what do we need to do? Wash our hands. Now, it doesn't have to be immediate. You don't have to wash your hands immediately after you take the gloves off. Because remember, these are the patient's cooties. And patient's cooties can stay in the patient environment. So we can continue working with that patient, but we can't take the patient's cooties out of the patient environment. So we need to wash our hands at the end of the seal. Good? Thanks. Did that answer your question? So most of my job in this class is not teaching you new stuff. It's actually breaking down the stuff that you think you know. Okay. Mark Twain actually had a saying a long time ago. Um, it's not what you know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> yeah, and it's really funny because that saying is always attributed to Mark Twain, right? Can you repeat it? Like, I want to write that down. It's not what you know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know that just ain't so. And it's funny because that saying is attributed to Mark Twain. He never actually said it. <laughs> Who said it? Do you know? Who knows? Right? No, yeah, no, nobody. Yeah, nobody knows. Yeah. But people know for sure that Mark Twain said that. And it's so funny because... That's what the saying is all about. Yeah. Yeah. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And that's a lot of what I have to do with you. And that's why I go through these very long lectures. It's not because I'm trying to teach you something. It's trying, it's because I'm trying to unteach. I have to get over all of your learning obstacles. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. So let's talk about glove removal. This is going to be on page 43. And if you give me just a moment. Um, okay. These are going to be too big for you, and that's okay. Um, but I'm going to pass this around. I want everybody to take two gloves out of here, one set of gloves, one for each of your hands while I get this set up, okay? So just pass that all the way around and I'll be right back. Give me just a second.
Okay, so this is like a really fun experiment. Those of you who are playing along at home, you go get some shaving cream, just regular um, white foam shaving cream, not the gel stuff. And you add in a little bit of food coloring, makes this. So I'm gonna um, put these on the table. And in just a moment, I'm going to show you what to do with it. And it's going to help us remove our gloves properly without contaminating ourselves, okay? So I want you to put your gloves on. Okay, we've already learned when we're supposed to wear gloves and um, that the first thing our gloves should touch is the patient, right? But the most important part of wearing gloves, honestly, is taking them off properly because the chance of um, cross-contamination is pretty high. So we're gonna learn how to take our gloves off, but we're going to contaminate them first because that's going to tell us whether we did it right. First of all, when you have gloves on, you should always be aware of where your hands are. Your hands should always be in front of you um, because remember your hands do things without your permission all the time. So I'm gonna take a little bit of the um, shaving cream and I'm gonna rub it on my hands and that you're going to as well. So everybody take a little bit of shaving cream and rub it on your hands, just a little bit. So you can see that I am quite contaminated, okay? This is yellow, so we're gonna call it urine. <laughs> okay, so now you have urine all over your gloves. Well, clearly you don't want this guy's urine on your skin, okay? So I can't go underneath. If I go underneath, I'm going to touch my skin with this contaminant. So in order to take gloves off, we're going to pinch up, not underneath, don't put your finger under, you're going to pinch up and you're going to pull this glove off inside out. Ooh. These don't stretch very well. Pull this glove off inside out. And do it without contaminating yourself. Now you want to hold it in that glove so it doesn't wave around and contaminate other things. Yeah. And then you're going to go underneath here and pull this one off inside out. Now, I contaminated myself. Okay. I contaminated myself. So you're going to want to practice this a couple of times so that you can take these gloves off without contamination. Okay. Yes. They don't test you on this specifically. They're not going to put on a pair of gloves and, and uh, grade you on how you take them off. But every, glo every glove skill, every skill where you wear gloves, you are graded on how you remove them. And they're watching to see if contamination occurred. Can you wear So, yes, you can for the test. You can just throw those away, trash cans over here. Um, yes, you can. You can wear rings for the test. But at, a, at workplace, can I? You would go by your facility policy. Yes, please. Yep, you're going to go by your facility policy. So that is a great question for um, interviews if rings are important to you. I'll tell you a little story about rings. When I was very, very young in my career, brand new nurse, thought I knew it all. Honestly, knew nothing. <laughs> but um, I was changing a chucks out underneath a very, very obese patient. And I had um, I had a ring on, my uh, engagement, yeah, we're over here, engagement wedding ring on. Had gloves on, obviously, because I'm underneath the patient's bottom. And she was probably you know, four or 500 pounds. She's very obese. And when I tucked the chucks underneath her, she was up on her side. She rolled back onto my arms. So my arms are stuck under her. And I had no choice. I had to pull my arms out 
And I tried to press down as much as I could, you know, but as I pulled out, my ring cut through my glove, but it gouged right, right in. I mean, she had a, a wound, very significant wound, all because of my ring. And that made me feel really bad. You know, it, it, it's not her fault, you know. Um, so from then on, I didn't wear, and you don't see, I, I am married. I do have jewelry, um, but you won't see me wear it in here. Um, I don't wear jewelry in a clinical setting. Uh, be, to me, the risk just isn't worth it. So I got a long chain. I put my rings on my chain, tucked it down inside my top. And that's where I always, you know, I always had them on me, but they didn't need to be on my fingers. Now, the other part of that, which is the really gross part, is that her skin was now, her flesh was now embedded in my ring. And you're not going to be able to get it out. I mean, it's going to be in there forever. You know, microscopic particles of this woman's bottom, it, now I'm carrying around with me for the rest of my life. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So it's just, that's just not a risk that I'm willing to take, right? So that marriage didn't last, so the ring is gone. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three people don't work in a marriage. That's right. <laughs> So yes, if jewelry is important to you, it's a question you're going to want to ask during the interview. It's based on facility policy. For the test, they're not grading on it. If you want to wear rings, it's fine. If you want to wear bracelets, it's fine. But they will watch you wash your hands. And they're going to make sure that you're going around that jewelry. Because remember, that jewelry will harbor pathogens. Okay. So watch. wash your jewelry as well. Okay. So good? Questions? Did you guys learn anything about gloves? Yes. So, yeah. To take gloves off, we're going to pinch up, pull off, and then go under and pull off. Okay. So this is a picture that showed, for those of you playing along at home especially. So we pinch up at the cuff, pull that off. We're going to hold it in that gloved hand so it doesn't, you know, spread the contamination around. And then we go under and pull off. So here are our glove rules. We're going to assess whether we need gloves on every skill. It's not, gloves are never based on the skill. A lot of students ask me, well, which skill do I have to wear gloves? It doesn't work like that because it's based on the patient. I may not have to wear gloves for you to take your pulse, but you, I might need to because you've got an incision on that arm. It's not based on the skill. It's based on the patient. Okay. So we're going to evaluate for gloves with every skill we do. All right, so let's learn how to take a pulse. This is going to be on page 52. So we know skill rules. We're going to follow the care plan. We know every skill starts with the opening and every opening starts with a knock. We know to evaluate whether we need gloves and we know how to do our closing. So we know 90% of this skill. Now what we're going to focus on is the skill specific steps. The things that have to do with pulse itself. Okay. So let's talk about what a pulse is. In your body, you have arteries. So your heart is going to pump blood and push it out. And that blood is going to spread to all areas of your body through your arteries. Think of arteries like roadways. Okay. When your heart squeezes, it pushes out a wave of blood and that wave is going to push the one in front of it. And that wave pushes the one in front of it. And that wave pushes the one in front of it. So if I were to cut your artery open, you would actually see waves and valleys, waves and valleys, waves and valleys. Well, if we press down on an artery with our fingers, we can actually feel those waves moving through. That's what a pulse is. It is a wave of blood moving through an artery under our fingertips. Now, if we count how many waves, then we know how many times the heart beat. Because remember, the wave is produced by the heart contracting. So if we count the waves, we know how many times the heart contracted. Make sense? That's what a pulse is. Now, when we're taking a pulse, we never, ever want to use our thumb. 
because your thumb has an artery, you'll get your own pulse. That will help you. <laughs> we always want to use two fingers. And when we're taking a pulse, we want to use our, our index finger and our middle finger, two fingers. And we want to use the fingertips, not the flat part. This doesn't have as many nerve endings. Fingertips have way more. So we want to use the fingertips, okay, and never the thumb. So to count the pulse, you're going to count the number of thumps you feel moving under your fingers, and a normal pulse rate is 60 to 100. So if we get 62, that's normal. Good job. If we get 98, that's normal. Good job. If we get 106, is that normal? No. What would we do if we got something that was abnormal? Notify the nurse. Okay. Now, sometimes we even have to notify the nurse of normal, though. If we got 62, which is normal, but we go to record it in the patient's chart and all the other readings on there are 98, 104, 100, 96, 98, is 62 normal for the patient? No. So we would still have to let the nurse know. Even though 62 is normal, it's not normal for the patient. Make sense? Okay. So when we're taking a pulse, the best way to find a pulse is to put your hand out like you're going to shake somebody's hand, okay, with your thumb pointing up. If you follow that thumb down to where your, your wrist bends, right, the bendy part of the wrist where the lines are, follow that thumb down. There's a bone right there. You find the bone? You feel the bone? Okay. If you stand your fingers up on that bone and then roll them forward and put your thumb on the back, you will find your pulse. That's where your pulse is. It is just below the bone on the thumb side of the wrist. And you need to put your thumb on the back side. Now, if I put my fingers there, I'll probably feel it. Probably. The problem is that over time, my fingers are going to relax. And then I'll lose the pulse. And then I'd have to restart. If you put your thumb on the back, it holds consistent pressure. And you're less likely to lose the pulse. Okay. So the thumb on the back is actually a very important part of taking your pulse. Do most facilities use those oximeters? So yes, a lot of places will use a pulse oximeter, oximeter. which is, it looks like a clothespin. You put it on, I've got one here, I'm just being lazy. <laughs> okay, so this is a pulse ox. This is what it looks like, like a little clothespin looking thing. Goes on the finger, you press the start button. And down here at the bottom, I'm sorry, uh, this one's the top. Up here at the top, you're going to see my oxygen. And then down here, you're going to see my pulse rate. Okay. So this tells you my pulse. So my pulse is 80. Normal. Is that normal? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to die today. <laughs> Unless uh, maybe driving on 19, <laughs> but <laughs> not from this. <laughs> okay. Good. Make sense? So yeah, a lot of places will use pulse oximeters and that gives you a pulse reading and that's great. But what if this, what if the battery's dead in this? Plus it's good to just know how to do the old fashioned thing. We need to know, yep. What if this gave me a really weird reading? What if it told me 124? Right, because I don't trust this machine, right? The machine may have dropped on the floor and gotten out of calibration. There's a lot of things that can happen with this. So if it gives me an abnormal reading, I probably want to double check it before I go to the nurse. Because if I go to the nurse, say, hey, that guy's pulse is like 246. Yeah, the, yeah, the nurse is going to like, whoa, what? <laughs> I've never seen that before. What? Yeah, that, the, that nurse is not going to call the doctor and say, oh, my gosh, we got a pulse of 246. If that nurse is not absolutely positively sure that pulse is 246. <laughs> right? So we always double check it manually before we go report it. And then don't get offended if the nurse also checks it. Because they're the ones that have to call the doctor. CNAs don't call the doctor. All right. So when we're taking a pulse, it's important that the elbow is supported on a table, on a chair, on the bed, on something. If you just have the patient's arm hanging out here, 
in midair, what happens is that muscle has to engage to keep the arm upright. That makes the muscle work harder. Muscles that work harder need to be fed. So that means that the heart's going to have to pump faster to get more blood to that muscle because it's extended. So what did we do to the pulse rate? We raised it. And that's not an accurate reading then. Does that make sense? So always make sure that the elbow is supported when we're taking a pulse. Good. Let's look at the care plan for the state exam. Our care plan, this is the actual care plan you're going to get on the test. This is it. This is all the words you're going to get on the test. It says patient will be lying in bed for skill. Take the patient's radial pulse measured at the wrist for one full minute and record your readings. How long are we counting for? One full minute. One full minute. Now, in a clinical setting, you don't always have to count for one full minute. In fact, we hardly ever count for one full minute. In a clinical setting, we usually count for 15 seconds. It's a shorter way of taking the pulse. And as long as the pulse is regular, it's perfectly okay. Because if I take that pulse for 15 seconds, multiply that by four, it's a whole minute. Okay, so I can take a snapshot, multiply it by four and get my whole minute. And it took less time. Make sense? Why can't I do that for this patient? The care plan, absolutely. Our care plan told us one full minute. Now this patient may be on a medication. I need a much more accurate reading. They may have a, a condition that requires a more accurate reading. They may have an irregular pulse. The pulse is irregular. Multiplying that by four isn't going to get you a good number. Okay. So there's a lot of reasons that the nurse may need it to be over one full minute. We don't care. We don't need to know why. We're just going to follow the instructions. Okay? Good? Make sense? All right. So our step-by-step -step instructions are located on page 53. At the top of the page, you'll see that care plan that we just read together. You'll see step-by-step -step instructions going down the page. You'll see a sample of the documentation form. And when you look at that documentation form, you're going to see there's two places to record the pulse. That's because in Florida, we have two evaluators. We get to count with both of them. So you're going to count the pulse once with evaluator one. You get to write that down. They're not going to make you remember it. And then you're going to count with evaluator number two because they have to be able to grade you independently. And then it'll be in the same room, and then I'm just going to be evaluated one. This is my reading. You're just going to write it down. Oh, okay. Yep. So are you doing it on the same patient? You're just doing it twice? But just I'm doing it twice on the same patient. Yeah. Because on the other side of the patient, the evaluator will also be taking the pulse. Wow. And that's how they're going to grade your accuracy. Is it usually pretty accurate on each? Probably pretty close. Well, yes, because the heart is what dictates the pulse. Okay. The heart squeezes, pushes out a wave. Okay. That wave goes throughout the body. So a pulse on this arm and this arm is exactly the same. Okay. But you said that that is four digits variation that we can... You can be off, yeah. So if they got 76 and you got 72, you're still accurate. Now, if somebody's had a stroke or something like that, and then once they affected, maybe that could affect. It, it could affect, yes. Side. Okay, could affect. So you probably want to take it if you have a patient that's had a stroke. Would you want to take it on the good arm then? You're going to follow your care plan. Okay, that makes sense. But okay, so they would even specify there too in the care plan. If care plan. Sense. If if there is a concern, yeah. okay. if it's relevant, okay, then the care plan will address it. Okay. Any questions on this? So here are the checkpoints that you're being graded on. This came directly from the checklist. Okay. You want to support the arm. You don't want to use your thumb to take the pulse. You need to use your fingertips. The radial pulse is at the top of the thumb side of the wrist. We're going to um, follow our care plan and count for one full minute. 
normal is between 60 and 100. We're going to say start and stop when we start counting and stop counting. So the evaluators start counting when we do and stop counting when we do. And we're going to make sure we document. Okay. Does that make sense? Are we, are we counting out loud then? No, you don't want to count out loud. Okay. Because if you count out loud, it can throw off the evaluator. Oh, okay. We're not allowed to have a smart watch, but we should have a watch that does. You can have a watch with a second hand. It's perfectly okay. But there's going to be a clock right above the bed okay. in the testing center. Yeah. The testing center has to have two clocks, one above the sink and one above the bed. So would you suggest that we look at the clock above the bed if we're taking health patients in the bed? I would, yeah. myself, yes. It'd be a lot easier than coming down. Okay. Yeah. So any questions on this? There are lots of different pulse points in the body. Lots. Um, the one that we're going to use most often as a CNA is the radial pulse at the wrist. We don't use the carotid here unless we think the patient is dead because putting your hand around somebody's neck can be very triggering. Okay. Um, what is the patient's body position for? You can take a pulse with any position. Sitting, laying, standing on their head, doesn't matter. You can take a pulse in any position. For the test, the patient's going to be laying in bed. I need to make sure that the elbow is supported. In the right. Bed. Okay. So we're going to divide up into groups of three right now. And I know that I have, um, I don't have the right amount of people in here. So we're going to do the best we can, but we're going to divide into groups of three and we're going to practice this skill. So okay. I'm going to ask you to come sit in this chair and I'm going to ask you to turn your chair around facing there. Okay. And um, I'm going to have you turn your chair around and face them. And I'm going to work with you. So those of you playing along at home, what we're doing is I've divided them into teams of three. One person is the patient. The other, the second person is the CNA. The third person is the evaluator. Okay. So the CNA and the evaluator are going to start counting the pulse at the same time. I'm going to do the timing. I'm going to say start and stop. You playing along at home, you can find your pulse and start counting when I say start, stop counting when I say stop. You just don't have anybody to double check your readings. Okay. So the person that's single, so you are the patient, you are the patient, and you are the patient. I'll be your patient. Okay. So patient, I want you to put both arms out on the table supported. And then my CNAs and my evaluators, I want you to find the pulse on the arm closest to you. Do not use your thumb to take your pul take the pulse and make sure the arm is supported. If you have trouble finding the pulse, let me know. So it's going to be, if you use your fingertips, just relax for me. Relax, relax, relax. Okay. Her pulse is right here, right there. Got it? Did you get it? All right, don't, um, don't count yet. Just find the pulse. I'm going to say start in just a minute. Just let me know when you have the pulse. Need help? You got it? You got it? Okay. So you're going to find the pulse on me. Okay. And find the pulse. So it's going to be right down here. Press a little bit hard. Maybe not quite that hard. <laughs> it's okay. Did you get it? You feel it? A little harder. A little bit more pressure. Okay. When I say start, I want you to count the thumbs you feel under your fingers until I say stop. Ready? Start.
Scott, what'd you get? 81. I got 82. Very good. Okay. What'd you get? Okay. Okay. So you would want, if you stop feeling the pulse for the test, you're going to want to start again. Okay. So now you are going to be the patient. So you'll put both of your hands out and both of you are going to count. You're going to be the patient, put both of your arms out and you guys are going to count. You're going to be the patient. Okay. And then both of you will count. Okay. And you can just take a nap. <laughs> All right. Go ahead and find the pulse on the arm closest to you. Yeah. That's what I'm here for. See how I'm using my fingertips? Yeah. So let's come back just up a little bit. Put your thumb on the back. Yeah, and press a little harder. I feel it. I found it. Go ahead and find it. And then when I say start, you're going to start counting. You guys good? 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 Okay. If you're down a little too low, it's going to be way up here. Right there. Okay, that's right. You're going to come up a little bit more. Put your thumb on the back. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. A little less pressure. You might be crimping it down. Got it. Got it? I lost hers. I had it for one more minute. I lost it. Okay. It's going to be right here. Okay. A little harder. Yeah. Oh, she's had a good pause. You go, Jessica. <laughs> okay. Ready? Yeah. Set. Start. Stop. That's okay. That's all right. What'd you get? What'd you get? And I had 65, so we've been Okay, that's okay. All right. So the last person who has not been a patient is now the patient. Okay. So when you're trying to find the pulse, you want to start light. Okay. So you put your thumb on the back. You want to start light because some people's arteries are really close. If you don't feel it, press a little bit harder, a little harder, a little harder, a little harder until you get that right pressure. Okay. If you press too much, it's like crimping a straw. Nothing gets through. Okay. So when you have the pulse, say yes. 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 a little harder. Ready, set, start. <clears throat>
stop. Okay. Okay, go ahead and resume your seats. So this is a skill that you can practice at home. You can either practice on yourself or if you've got a live human laying around, grab them. Um, dead ones don't help real well. So try to find a live one. Um, but this you can practice this on pretty much any age. I will tell you that young people have a much faster pulse rate. So if you're practicing this on a child, the normal values are going to be a little bit higher than what normal values are for adults. Fifteen year olds should be in the normal value. Right. Right. What would children do then? Uh, depends on the age. Oh. There's all, all different types of stages. It's not something you need to know. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when we talk about um, CNA training, we are training for adult CNA work. We're not training for pediatrics. If you go to work in a pediatric setting, they're going to provide specialized training related to pediatrics. And they would train you then? Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So any questions on Pulse? No? That's our first skill. Congratulations. <laughs> Took us a while to get here, but we got our first skill down. So let's move on to another one. This is going to be on page 102. We're going to learn how to dress a resident with a weak arm. So this is different than just dressing. So dressing is just dressing. It's like you get dressed, you know. Everybody has their own preferences. Some people put their socks on before their pants. Some people put their socks on after their pants. Everybody has different preferences. Learn your patients. Remember, help isn't help if it's not helping. Okay. But when a patient has a weak arm, things change because it's most of what we wear are pullover. Almost most clothing goes over the head, like what you're wearing now. But if a patient has a affected shoulder, a weak arm, limited mobility, maybe they're paralyzed, it could be a, a wide range of things. Um, it may be difficult for them to extend their arms to get them through the sleeves of a pullover shirt. In that case, we tell the patients or the families to go get items that button or snap up the front. Okay. If they have a weak arm, you say you want yep. to button, button So we want something that fastens in the front. Okay. All right. So that means that it's easier to dress side to side than top to bottom when we have some mobility issues. Now we have to learn how to dress side to side, and there's a format that we're going to use for that, which we're going to get into in just a few minutes. But it, it's a little bit different than dressing somebody that has full mobility, okay? And when we get to the care plan, I'll get into that a little bit more. So if you look at this, if you look at all the principles, man, there's a whole lot more there than what we know, right? We know to follow the care plan. We know to do the opening. We know to evaluate for gloves. And we know to do the closing. We've got those four down, but there's three more on here that we don't know. So let's learn these three. Okay. Remember I said by next week, you're going to know almost everything on the back wall. So we're going to get into a new principle now. We are going to learn about the barrier. This is very quick and easy. Gloves took me an hour and a half to teach you. This takes me 10 minutes. But when we are working with supplies, any skill that has supplies, that means we have to have a place to put those supplies. Oh, Shay Shay, how long do you count a pulse? Well, it depends on what the care plan tells us. If the care plan says to count for one full minute, how long are we going to count for? One minute. If the care plan tells us or doesn't specify, 
then we can count for 15 seconds and multiply that by four to get our full minute. So how would I answer that question? How long do you count the pulse? The care plan, absolutely, absolutely. And that could be a written test question. How long do you count the pulse for? A, 60 seconds. B, 30 seconds multiplied by two. C, 15 seconds multiplied by four. Or D, however long the care plan indicates. You can, but you're not going to get as accurate a reading because it's such a small glimpse in time. And let's say we're off by one, okay? Let's say we counted 10, but there was actually 11. Well, when we multiply 10 by 6, we get 60. When we multiply 11 by 6, we get 66. So that's a bigger margin of error. Does that make sense? All right, so anytime that we have supplies, that means that we have to have a place to put those supplies. And most of the time, we're going to use a table like this. This is an overbed table. In a clinical setting, they're never clean. <laughs> they're never empty. Yeah. They have everything on them, cell phones, cell phone chargers, chapstick, crossword puzzle, bu uh, puzzle books, juice left over from breakfast. It's just like chaos. Okay. Do you think we can consider these tables clean? No. So that means that we have to have a way of making it clean, to have a clean place to put our supplies. And that's what a barrier is all about. So everything I'm about to tell you is on page 85. Again, you don't have to take notes. I've done that for you. Okay, so in a clinical setting, if I'm going to use supplies, come back into the frame here. If I'm going to use supplies, I have to have a clean place to put those supplies. And since we know the table isn't clean, we're going to use something on the table to create our clean surface. And that something is called a barrier. That's all it's called. It's just a something that you're putting on there to use as a clean surface. Now, a barrier can be a paper towel. It can be a bath towel. It can be a chucks. It could be anything, right, as long as you're making a clean surface. But for the test, we're going to use something very specific. This is called an under pad. It's actually a disposable under pad. It's got an absorbent side. It's got a plastic side, so it's waterproof. Um, some of you call them puppy pads. Right now I'm calling them puppy pads, right? Because I got a puppy. Um, but these are under pads. And we're going to use this for the test to create our clean surface. When we put this on the table, we want to put it absorbent side up. That way if we spill anything, it doesn't roll off the plastic side onto the floor. We want the absorbent side up. Now, this is a disposable under pad. There is a difference. Everything in medicine has two names to it. I don't know why I didn't write the rules. I really didn't. But you're going to find throughout this program that everything I introduce you to always has two names, sometimes even three. Um, so this is a disposable under pad. It's something that goes on the bed, you know, bed pad. Um, but it's something that we throw away when we're done with it. This is also an under pad, but this is a washable under pad. In most cases, this is going to be called a bed pad, and this is going to be called a chucks because we chuck it when we're done with it. Okay, so this is an under pad, this is an under pad, but they're two different things. So most of the time, you'll hear this called a bed pad and you'll hear this called a chucks. Either one can be used as a barrier. So can a paper towel, so can um, a bath towel, whatever you've got handy, okay? 
The point is that we need a clean place to put our clean supplies. Okay. Remember those tray tables are used for meals, they hold everything else, and our supplies that we're using are clean, so we can't put those clean supplies on the table. That's where the barrier comes in. If our table surface isn't clean, but we put a barrier on it, now we have that clean surface. And that's a good place to put our clean supplies. But here's the problem. Um, and we talked about this a few minutes ago, right? The problem is that your uniform is not clean when you start working. Your uniform is going to um, kneel on the floor to do foot care. It's going to lean against the bed when you're rolling a patient. It's going to brush up against the curtain. It's going to lean against the sink. Your uniform is not clean once you start work. So if I go over to get all of my supplies, let me move this real quick and show you. If I go over to get all of my supplies to do a skill, it doesn't matter what the skill is, and I grab my barrier and I grab the rest of my supplies, whatever they are, and I'm trying to go put this on the table, then I have to have two hands to spread this out. So what I end up doing is this. What is this touching? What is not clean? My uniform. You see how that's a problem? So when we're working with barriers, we don't get our supplies. We get the barrier. Okay? We go get the barrier first. We put that on the table because we have two hands. Then we go back and get the rest of the supplies that we need. It is a two-step process. Now, you're going to try to cut that into one step. That's just human nature. You're going to think to yourselves, oh, I can do it. <laughs> Don't. Get the barrier first, then go get your supplies. Because if you can take, that is a checkpoint, guys. That is a testing checkpoint. Don't let any supply touch your uniform. If the table has juice and food, we after we have the consent of the patient, we clean the table. You can't, yeah. Yeah, if it's got sticky stuff on it, I would wipe it off first. Yeah. You, there won't be for the test. I feel like, where do you put all that stuff then? Because there's never no room. Okay, so it. yeah. For the test, thankfully, um, they cheat. <laughs> the test crazy. the test cheats the table's always going to be empty it's going to be ready for you to use nobody's ever using it uh for anything else okay so the test cheats in a clinical setting you're not going to have a full table to deal with but just like i did a few minutes ago right just put it over it so i'm going to put my barrier over whatever is there okay. um or i could carve out a space for myself um whatever i need to do okay all right. Um, we have to work around our patients. Mm -hmm. But the point is, I don't want to put my clean clothes on this table. They're not clean. Mm -hmm. Right? So good. It's a two-step process. We're going to go get the barrier first, then get our supplies. Two steps. This is what's going to keep your supplies clean. So get the barrier, spread it on the table, get your supplies. Any questions on that? Go ahead. So if you need um, stuff on the table, you have to wash, once you clear the table, you have to wash your hands again. Because if there's stuff on the table. Right, but remember that's not going to be on the test. They're not going to throw you. Let me explain to you the test real quick. This is what we call a standardized test, which means that everybody has to have the same testing experience. Okay. So if you're testing in Miami, you're testing in Jacksonville, and you're testing in Tallahassee, and you all get this skill, it has to be set up the exact same way. Otherwise, it's not an even um, assessment of skills. So for you, if I've got a whole bunch of stuff on the table, and for you, the table is empty. That is not the same skill, okay? So the test does not throw curveballs. They can't. That's part of the contract. The test has to be standardized. Does that make sense? 
So for the test, we're not going to have to clean the table off or anything like that. In a clinical setting, yes, I would clean the table and then go wash my hands. Okay. With our workplace, um, my supplies will be always in the room. No, that's a very good question. We're going to get into that with linen rules in just a minute. But to answer your question, no, supplies are not kept in the patient's room. For the test, they are. So, yeah, for the test, it's set up just like this. You've got all the supplies right there next to the bed. It's easy. But in a clinical setting, your um, supplies are in a linen cart in the hallway or in a special room called a clean utility room. So it does complicate this a little bit. Okay. Um, the whole, how do I put this? The point is you don't want to go in with your supplies. If you go in with your, if I walk in with a whole bunch of supplies in my hands and I ask you, hey, can I do hand and nail care? It's going to kind of reduce your ability to say no because I've got everything there, right? It kind of predisposes the patient to cooperate. And that's really taking their rights away. Um, so you're going to handle this the way your facility wants it handled. Again, that's going to be a facility issue. Question, what if the table's dirty? but then you put the berry on it and they have to touch it while you're gone, the table or anything. That's okay. okay. Patient cooties. And then also, if there's too much stuff on there, how would you approach them to see if they could possibly... Yeah, hey, can I move... I, I need that table to do the skill. Can I move this stuff over there on your dresser? I got you. Yeah. Um, or can I just push everything to the side and carve a space yeah. out or whatever? But what if they say no to that? Anytime a patient says no, who do we tell? The nurse. The nurse. Yep. Yeah. Because here's the thing, and this is what a lot of people don't realize. Being a patient is stressful. Okay? It's very stressful. You're surrounded by strangers. They're wanting to do stuff to you. And a lot of times, patients will say no just to exert some control. It's the only control they have. It's the only thing they can control. Well, that tells me as a nurse that they're feeling very vulnerable. If they're telling you, no, you can't dress them or no, you can't brush your teeth or no, you can't do hand and nail care or whatever, right? That's telling me that the patient is struggling with something. It could be emotional and they need a little more support. It could be a lack of understanding and I need to explain what we're doing. It could be that they hurt somewhere and that's something I need to address. But all of those things are something that the nurse has to address. Okay. So patients that are stressed often get attachment disorders to their stuff. Remember, it's a control issue, right? If all I can control in my world is right here, if this is the only thing in the world I have control over, then I'm going to control this. <laughs> right? So that tells me that as a nurse... I need to, to work with the patient a little bit more emotionally because they're feeling very vulnerable. They've got an attachment disorder that we have to address. So you could say, well, maybe I could try back with you later, maybe in another couple hours, I can check back in with you and see if you sure. need to. But still let the nurse know. Okay. Because what happens if you have an emergency, right? Right, And you have to leave the facility because right. your son got sick or whatever. Right. Now, a task wasn't done and nobody knows that the task wasn't done. Right. So anytime a patient refuses, you, you have to let I the nurse see. know. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. okay. Even if you're going to go back later. Right. If the family's there and they don't want foot care right now, no problem. But I'm going to let the nurse know, hey, I'm not doing foot care because family's in there. I'll circle back later. Right. Okay. That way it doesn't get missed. Right. Good? Okay. Everybody understand barrier rules? Okay. So barriers provide a clean area for your clean supplies. Barriers are only um, are going to be gotten first before we get the supplies. And we're going to touch the supplies with our clean hands. Okay. Make sure nothing touches your uniform. All right. So let's work on privacy blanket. This is another principle. A privacy blanket is used any time the patient is uncovered or undressed, and it's used to keep the patient warm and covered. Now, there's a, a thing about privacy blankets. People have this mental block about them. 
So I want to go over this real quick. That privacy blanket is there for more than, than what you think it is. You and the patient have totally different perceptions of temperature. You are fully clothed and you are running around like a chicken with your head cut off. You've got way more to do than you can possibly get done. So the temperature in the facility is going to feel significantly warmer to you than it does to the patient. Patient's not active at all. They're laying in bed. They're in a thin hospital gown covered by a sheet. That's it. So what do you think the temperature is going to feel like to them? Now take that sheet away. Yeah. Are they comfortable? So anytime we uncover the patient, we have to give them something else, something to keep them warm. But it's also there for privacy. Yes, the privacy curtain does block that patient from everybody out here. Absolutely, it does. But there's still a stranger in that area with them. Do you know who the stranger is? Yeah. You. And they may not be altogether too happy about showing you all their goodies. You may, in your mind, think, oh, I've seen them all. Could care less. Been there, done that. I'm not looking. I don't care. But that's not your patient's experience. So you have to be careful about getting jaded here and think about things from your patient's point of view. If you were the one laying in that bed, would you want to be exposed? Even if that person that's seeing it has seen a million of them, would you want to be exposed? So we have to go into this with that mindset. That is what a privacy blanket is for, is to keep the patient warm, but it's also to keep them covered so that when we're working with the patient, we can only expose the area that we need to work on and not the whole patient. Okay. I apologize. I'm losing my voice. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, the curtain is not enough. The curtain is never enough because you are still in there with the patient. Please keep that in mind. So we're going to use a privacy blanket anytime the patient is uncovered or undressed. So how we put the blanket on then becomes an issue. You don't want to take the sheet off and then put the blanket on <coughs> because that exposes the patient during that process. We want to put the blanket on over the sheet and then pull the sheet down underneath. That way the patient is never exposed during the process. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. When we put the blanket on, we don't do it like we do at home. At home, when I'm changing my sheets, I take that sheet and I just snap it, right? Spread it all out. Well, if you do that, you'll notice like little dust stuff come up. Those are dead skin cells, yeast, and bacteria that came off of your body and anybody else that's been in that bed. Now at home, it's just my funk I'm breathing in and my husband's my dogs. But in a clinical setting, I don't want to be breathing in that funk. <laughs> so you don't snap or shake anything in a clinical setting because it creates a vortex and brings those items right up into your breathing zone. Okay. So when it comes to using a privacy blanket, it's never going to say it on the care plan. This is one of those nursing principles that you need to know, just like a barrier. It's never going to tell you on the care plan to use a barrier. It's a nursing principle you need to know. So nobody's ever going to tell you, yeah, use a privacy blanket. That's a nursing principle you need to know. Does that make sense? All right. So we've talked a lot about the care plans and care plans are very patient specific. What we're getting into now are universal principles that everybody needs to know, okay? So using a privacy blanket ensures that the patient is always covered with something. We're not going to snap or shake it. Sometimes I get ahead of these slides. <laughs> and at the end of the skill, when we're all done, we have to wait until after we take our gloves off to remove that blanket at the end of the skill. And think about all the things those gloves have touched. Remember, we're wearing gloves if we're gonna to touch body fluids, right? 
So think about all the things that are on that, that glove. Now, if you touch that, think about the shaving cream you had all over your gloves. If you touch that sheet that's going to go right up next to their face with that shaving cream, that's going to make that sheet, which is in their breathing zone, contaminated. I just want to clarify, I, I've heard this all throughout my life, like the five second rule. Like, so once when something clean touches something unclean, the entire surface of that clean thing is infected, right? Like there's no point of safety. Type okay. Situation. So there's two principles here I need to go over with you. There's a difference between clean and contaminated. Okay. And this is hard to wrap your head around as a CNA. So the best way for me to explain it as a CNA, we're just going for clean. So think of yourself when you brush your teeth in the morning, right? So you brush your teeth and you get toothpaste in the wash basin, you know, your sink. Um, you just rinse it out, right? You don't disinfect your sink every time you use it. You just get the big globs out. Make sense? And we call it clean. It's really kind of clean enough, right? It's not disinfected. It's just clean. Well, as CNAs, that's the realm we live in. We live in clean. Not disinfected. Okay. Does that make sense? So there is always, always as a CNA, a crossover between clean and unclean. Always. Because at the center of everything we do is a patient. And the patient is never clean. So there's always a crossover. Always. So that five second rule that you're talking about doesn't really apply here. That's more for contaminated, disinfected, or if we go even a step further, sterile technique. Okay. And that doesn't apply to what we do. Okay. So now I said clean, right? So there are some things that we do have to keep in mind though. For instance, our uniform is not clean. The floor is not clean. So we don't want items to touch our uniform. If they do, we have to address it. We don't want anything to touch the floor because if we do, we have to address it. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we're going to remove our, we're going to do our skill. We're going to take care of everything that needs to be taken care of. So put our dirty linens away while we have gloves on, clean our basin, all of the things that have to be done. And then we're going to take our gloves off and take the blanket away. You don't have to because patient cooties are patient cooties. You're going to wash your hands after, after the closing. So could you reuse that same blanket the next time you're in there since you didn't touch it with your dirty gloves? You want to go by your facility policy, but usually no. Mm -hmm. Usually no. But it only touches the patient. I know. And your facility may be fine with that. It really is kind of a skill by skill basis. Okay. But here's the thing. And we're going to get to this with London rules. And there's a principle that explains why. So I'm going to put you on hold for just a second. Okay. All right. Okay, so you don't want to contaminate the sheet that's going to go right up next to the patient's face by touching the sheet with those gloves. I use cooties because it's an easy concept to envision. So let's get into linen rules, and this is going to explain your principle. Okay, so linen rules, we already know most of this. We've already covered it. So linens can't touch your uniform. Um, notes are on page 87. Sorry, guys. Lindens can't touch your uniform. We already know this one because your uniform is not clean, right? We have to have clean hands to get linens. We already know this one too because we learned it in barrier rules, right? Clean supplies need clean hands. We've learned that one too. Um, remember anything that's repeated? 
is doubly important. It's going to count big on the state exam. So these two are important principles. Um, we don't want to snap or shake linens. Yeah, we covered that too, right? So these are important principles. But now we're going to get to the last one. We're going to come back to those two in the middle in a, in a future lesson. Let's get to that last one. Unused items must be discarded. So what that means is if I take too many washcloths into that room, I can't leave them in that room for later. Because anything that's out of our sight can't be considered clean. So if we leave the blanket in the room to use it later, it's out of our sight. So we can't use it at a later time. Does that make sense? So that's why it has to be discarded. This is just a general principle. Let me tell you why this exists. Let's talk about Martha and Henry. Henry's in the hospital. He had an open bypass surgery, open heart. He's getting ready to go home. You've gone in in the morning. You started to get him ready. But he said, hey, my wife's coming in. Just hold off. I don't want to get dressed yet because I might be going home today. And I think she's brought, brought me a pair of clothes. So let's hold off. You say, cool, no problem. So you leave the room and you leave everything in there to get him washed up and dressed later. It's sitting on the chair beside his bed. Martha comes in with two cups of coffee and she looks around and there's nowhere to sit because all that stuff is on the chair. So she just kind of settles in on top of the stuff and she sits there. And while she goes to hand Henry his cup of coffee, part of it spills on the floor. So she gets up and she puts her cup down and she picks up a washcloth and she cleans up that coffee, but there's never a dirty hamper in the room. We don't keep dirty stuff in those rooms. So now she has no idea what to do with that washcloth that she just cleaned the floor with. So she folds it up and puts it back on the stack of linens. That is why if something is out of our sight, we cannot consider it clean. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. So yeah, theoretically, you're right. It, it just was on the patient. It probably could be used again. But because someone came into that room and then touched that blanket, we just don't know. And the patient keeps it, they're going to take it home. Right. We just don't know. So then technically, if you had all your supplies in there and you were going to get ready to go, you'd have to take all those supplies back and put them back on the shelf or technically you have to put them in a contamination. you got unused them. items have to be okay. discarded. Okay. The supply shelf is like an ATM. Okay. You can take money out. You can't put it back in. Okay. Gotcha. That makes sense. So clean supplies are clean. Anything that you put into clean supply can contaminate the whole thing. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Angel says, what if they have a blanket on top of the sheet? So here's the thing about privacy blankets. Don't get too deep into this. Um, you can drive yourself crazy with this because not every setting uses them and they should, I think they should, but they don't. But here's the thing. If you're going to uncover that patient, I want you to think about the psychological impact of that on the patient and also the physiological. How cold is that patient going to be? Right? So we have to think about these things. So if they've got a sheet and a blanket on like a bedspread, right? Um, I'm just not going to take all of that away and leave that patient uncovered on the bed, exposed for the whole world. They're not going to feel comfortable with that. They're probably going to be a little cold too. So if they got a sheet and a blanket on, I'm going to put the privacy blanket on and pull that down. Like I said, not every place uses privacy blankets. Some people will just go in and expose the patient and they're fine with it. I'm not. My job is to teach you the right way of doing things. It doesn't mean you're always going to see that out there. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to adhere to my principles. But let me tell you, if I'm the body in the bed, you better cover me. Because I'm going to have something to say about it. It's just not right. And remember, every patient that's in the bed is somebody's mom or dad or kid or grandma, and they really deserve the dignity and respect that we want for ourselves. Does that kind of make sense to you? So yeah, if they have a blanket on top of the sheet, all of that's going to be pulled down, and I'm still going to use a privacy blanket. Um, question, when you go get clean 
is is are they gonna have like a sanitizer or washing sink before you go into that cleaning? Right, room clean clean supply rooms always have a sink in them. Gotcha. Didn't know that. Okay. Yep. Personal blankets, like ones from home that go, are we allowed to take those away and wash them? Again, facility policy. Yeah, because and I can't give you one answer that's gonna cover all of that. In some facilities, the facilities handle all laundry. Some facilities don't let outside stuff in because the likelihood of it getting stolen or lost pretty high. Okay. If you're in a residential facility, a nursing home, assisted living facility, those patients have their own things. It's where they live. So some places the family's going to do the laundry because they don't want stuff missing. And that happens more than you would think. Um, so I can't give you one answer that's going to cover all of that. Okay. Facility policy. I know I keep going back to that, but it really is that individualized. Okay. All right. So we're going to cover the rest of linen rules in a future lesson. Just keep that in mind. But the first three we already know, don't touch, linens can't touch uniform. Uh, you have to have clean hands to get your linens and um, don't shake or snap. The new one to learn is that anything we don't use, we have to discard. We'll cover the rest of it coming up in a future lesson. All right, so now we know all of the principles involved in dressing a resident with a weak arm, except for dressing. So now we've got to cover the things that are related to dressing. But if you look at the checklist here, right? Look at how much green there is. All of those checkpoints are covered by which principle? Which one's green? The opening. So everything green there is going to get checked off when you do your opening. Everything red there is going to get checked off when you do your closing. Everything gray is going to get checked off of linen rules. The tan cover color is going to get checked off when you uh, use a privacy blanket. So only the things that are white are left for the skill. If you look at this, half of this skill is covered by principles, not by the skill. This is why we learn principles. Okay. Half of this skill has nothing to do with dressing. Half of the checkpoints. Sorry, the unused items that must be discarded, those are from things that we brought after the skill. Mm -hmm. Even if they weren't touched. Even if they weren't touched. Yeah, we can't leave them in the room because once they're out of our sight, they can't be considered clean. We don't know what, what else has touched them. All right. So again, and I'm not trying to push this on you guys, but just a reminder, because now we're getting into principles. We have the flashcards that have all of those principles on them. So it's a great way to learn the principles as we go through. Um, so just kind of a reminder of that. Set here. We can just look at to see what yeah, the, there's a set on the on my desk right there. Okay, you can take a look. There's I think 52 cards in there. Oh, yeah. Do you have to buy them online, or do you have them at store? I have them right here. Okay. You just buy them from me. Okay. Yeah, I do have them next door too, but it's okay. easier to get them from me. Okay. All right, so let's learn the skill specific steps. Okay, this is a little bit longer skill. So this is our second skill that we're learning. And um, I think you've got, if you look at the bottom of, what, it, what page is that? 102. Can you tell me what the clock says at the bottom? Uh, 14 minutes. 14 minutes. So somebody with your level of experience should be able to dress somebody with, within 14 minutes. Now, I don't know about you, but it does not take me 14 minutes to get dressed. It might take me that long to figure out what I'm going to wear, yes. But the actual dressing part does not take 14 minutes. They give you all the time you need for this. So let's learn the skill specific uh, steps. Um, one of the things that you want to ask the patient for this skill is what do you want to wear? Because patients have the right to choose their own clothing. The way you dress really is an outward expression of what you feel, what you believe, right? We use what we wear to express emotion. If I'm feeling a little glum today, I might be in gray sweats right? If I'm feeling a little happy today, I might be wearing a yellow dress. I don't know. 
I get to dress the way I feel. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, I know you guys are in uniform. That's different. If the employer is paying for your time, they're paying you to wear stuff. That's different. And I'm talking in general. So we want to ask our patient, what do you want to wear? And we want to get whatever it is that they want to wear. Now, sometimes patients don't have the ability to put an outfit together. It happens. Some people may say, I want my purple plaid pants and my yellow flowered shirt. And you're like, Yee, that does not work. You are allowed to suggest an alternative. Now, that's because you are judged by the way your patients look. If your patients don't match, their hair's all messy, if they got two different socks on, two different shoes on, you look like you're not paying attention. Okay? So because you were judged by the way your patients look, you can suggest an alternative. But if she says, no, I want my purple plaid pants and my yellow flowered shirt, then go put that on her. She has the right to wear what she wants. Maybe her kids are visiting today. And the son bought the pants and the shirt and the daughter bought the shirt. We don't know. We don't judge. You can suggest an alternative, but ultimately we're going to honor their wishes. Okay, good. Makes sense. So everyone has the right to choose their own clothing, even if it doesn't match. <laughs> a lot of your older men will get around this in a really funny way. You'll open up their closet. They've got the exact same shirt in 14 colors. <laughs> and they've got 14 pairs of khaki pants. <laughs> and everything matches. So they don't have to worry about making decisions like that. All right. So we want to get our barrier first. Remember, barriers always are first. And then we want to go get our patient's clothing that they uh, selected before we undress them. That order matters. Why do you think that order might matter? Yeah, absolutely. If we take the patient's clothes off and then we leave them to go get new clothes, that leaves them very vulnerable. Very vulnerable. So we want to go get our clothing before we undress the patient. This is a principle, guys. You want to minimize the time exposure is occurring. So we're going to pull the privacy curtain. We're going to get the clothes before we undress them. And we're definitely going to be using a privacy blanket during this scale. That way, as we're dressing different body parts, we're not exposing the whole thing. Just the areas we're working on. So this is a, something new that we need to learn. Anytime we lift an extremity, we always lift from below. So we're not the claw machine at Walmart. Like, we don't do this, you know, move stuff. This can put bruising on patients, right, your fingertips. But it also can cause, like, if the leg is heavy and your fingertips lose grip, it can cause it to fall, and that can cause injury. So we always lift from below, supporting at the joints. You don't want to lift like this. You don't want to grip flat palms. It minimizes injury. As we age, everything becomes more um, prone to injury. Okay? So we want to be very gentle with our patients. Now, the way that we're going to dress the patient, um, we're using an acronym here, USA FIRST. Undress strong arm first. USA. Undress strong arm. USA. Undress strong arm first. And then we'll dress the weak arm first. Now, what this does is it makes the stronger arm do all the work. So if the stronger arm has to move to get out of the garment, it just slides right off that weak arm. No movement required. And then we're going to slide the new garment right on that weak arm. No movement required. And make the strong arm do the movement to get in. Make sense? Okay. So USA first. You will have a test question on the written test asking you about this. Okay. We undress the strong arm first and then dress the weak arm first. So the clothes should be slid up the weak arm carefully. Please be careful not to overextend or force movement. 
All right. Let me. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. And we know she's got a week on, but maybe everything else with her is fine. So could she sit up in bed while we're trying to? Do, I guess not because she has to be covered. I'm just trying to think about this. She's not incapable any other way. It's just that one arm. Every patient's going to be different. Okay. So it just depends on what they are. And then you just go with it. Right. Every patient's going to be different. So I can't give you one answer that's going to solve all of the scenarios right. that you're coming up with. Right. Um, so we're going to work with the patients. Right. She has been getting dressed as long as she's been getting dressed. So let's take our cues from her. Right. Okay. And I always involve my patients. Remember, I'm not there to do anything to them. Right. I'm there to help them. So I'm going to ask her, you know, do you normally, if, if it's an unfamiliar patient to me, do you normally sit up on the side of the bed when you get dressed or do they put the head of the bed up? I'm trying to get, going to try to keep it consistent. Okay. And okay. you don't maybe worry so much about the privacy thing, like if she's sitting on the side of the bed. I'm going to show you. Okay. Yep. Just hold that thought. <laughs> hold that thought. Okay. This, this is actually, uh, the screen is actually illustrating it. Do you see how the privacy blanket, the head of the bed is up? Mm -hmm. Privacy blanket is over her and the corners are tucked behind her. Right. So it's forming like a drape, right. which still allows me access to both of her arms to get her dressed right. while maintaining privacy. Right. Okay. If she's sitting up on the side of the bed, then privacy may not be as important to her right. and she may be okay with exposure. Okay. But I always, always default to minimizing exposure whenever possible. And I could ask for you, like you said. Sure. Okay. But every situation is going to be different. Right, right. Okay. okay. Um, Brenda, that's a very good question. Best way to answer a question in an interview, what is your occupational goal? And I'm not going to answer that right now because I want to stay on topic. But if you go back and watch the last session that we just had, class eight, class eight. I go over interview tips and how to answer specific questions. Um, but short answer, be honest with them. It's not going to penalize you. If you want to go on for nursing, be honest with them. Let them know, hey, my goal is to be an LPN within two years and an RN in four. Because they may have a scholarship program. If they help you with school, then you'll come back and work as a nurse. We have a horrible nursing shortage. If they can keep you, they will. So be honest with them. If you want to go to school for an electrician and this is just a stopgap measure to make money while you're going to school, let them know. Okay. Be honest with them. Okay. If you're undecided, that's a perfectly appropriate feeling as well. I don't know what I, guys, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up yet. I still haven't figured it out. I love what I do now. Does that mean I'm going to do it for every day for the rest of my life? Maybe. I don't like what I do, but maybe not. Maybe another opportunity might come up. Maybe I could be selected to work on a task force, which could help um, standardize CNA training across the nation. That would be an appropriate use of my skill, right? So I don't know. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I'll work that in as a part-time job. Yeah. Um, if you don't know, that's okay too. You know, I'm very interested in medicine, but I'm really not sure where I want to end up yet. I'm not sure. I'm open. That's perfectly okay as well. That's okay. a good response. I'm open. I'm not sure. sure I'm open. Yeah, I'm open. I'm always open for opportunity. Yeah. Especially if it comes with a lottery check. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me talk to you about overextending or forcing movement. Um, I'm just going to turn the camera around here for a minute. I don't have my auto turner on right now, so I'm just going to do this manually. Let's, sorry, guys, I know that's a little quick. Let's go over here and take a look at this patient. So we were a testing center for several years. And this lady right here was one of our testing mannequins. Let me put the head of the bed down so I can show you this. So she was a mannequin that was used by students for skills testing. And there aren't very many skills that we do on mannequins. 
So dressing, partial bed bath, peri care, and catheter care. That's all we use the mannequins for. All right. So she was used for testing. Not training, testing. What's wrong with this picture? He just broke her leg. He just extended his hand like too far. Do feet normally come like that? No. Okay. That's a problem, isn't it? Looks like something needs to be reported to the nurse. Okay. <laughs> if we compare this leg, this foot does not do that. So that means that something happened to this foot to cause it to do that. Now, what you don't know is running down the, these legs are steel cables that hold these joints in place. That's why this one looks fine, normal. This one does not. During testing, somebody snapped that steel cable in her foot and broke the mannequin and then could not understand why they failed the test. If you broke a steel cable on a mannequin, what would it have done to a patient? And their response was, and I quote, well, I wouldn't have done that on a real person. <laughs> there it is. Can you say it louder? That's exactly right. You should have been treating the mannequin like it was a real person. Okay. So when I have this up on the screen, don't overextend or force movement. That is what I'm referring to. If you break the mannequins, you will fail the test. Because if you broke a mannequin, you broke a person. And if that were my grandma, oh, God help you. Right? So we've got to be really gentle with our patients and the mannequins. Be gentle. Don't force movement. And I know you guys are going to be super stressed out during the test. I get it. I understand. But that doesn't give you an excuse. Okay? Good? Makes sense? I like to show that example because that's true story really happened. That's how that mannequin, how her foot got broke. I had to go out and buy another mannequin. Those things are expensive. Too. Oh, yeah. It, it's like a used car. Yeah, they yeah. So um, you want to adjust the clothing for neatness. Make sure everything is lined up. All the buttons or snaps are lined up. You know, make sure the pants are over the butt. You know, the toe seams are along the toes. Make sure they look good. You are judged on how your patient presents at the end of the skill. Um, when everything is done, we're going to take the privacy blanket and the gown that came off the patient and put them in a dirty hamper. For the test, in your clinical skills room for the test, you're going to have all of your clean supplies and your dirty hamper right there in the area. It doesn't work like that in a clinical setting. We don't keep dirty things in the patient room. So put it in a bag and take it to the dirty linen area. They have bags in them. Right? Yeah. Okay, when we give the patient the call light, which side do you want to put it on? Strong arm. Strong arm. Why? She needs operated. <laughs> yeah, weak arm isn't working right now for whatever reason. So this is important. It is a testing principle. They get washed. They get washed. If it's their pajamas, they'll get washed either by the facility or the, pa the family. If it's a facility gown... Yeah, it gets washed and then redistributed. So, yeah, the gown you wear at a hospital has been worn by 14,000 other people. But washed. The sheets that you sleep on have been slept on by 14,000 other people, just like hotels. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, we don't, we don't throw them away. We just launder them. Yeah. So the patient, if their family washed the clothes from, they probably have a, you just put it in a bag for them, and when the family comes, they'll, they'll take it. Again, facility so policy. Okay. Yep, every place is going to handle that a little different. Okay. Okay. Some people don't have families. 
I know a lot of people don't that are in these mm -hmm. facilities. They don't have anybody nope. come see them. Nope. That's really sad. Yep. All right, so page 103 is going to give us our step-by-step -step instructions on how to do the skill. We've already read the care plan at the top of the page. Um, no, oh, maybe we didn't. Maybe we didn't. Let's read the care plan. So it's dress the resident in a long sleeve button or snap front shirt, pants, and socks. The resident is lying in bed and has a weak right arm. The resident is not able to help with dressing, and after dressing, leave the resident in bed. So that's our care plan. So which arm is weak? That's their right, not yours. You know, that always gets tricky when you're looking at somebody. It's yep. just the opposite. It is. It's their right, not yours. Be aware of that, because that is going to count here. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we could ask the resident's family for more comfortable e or easy to put on clothes. So would it be the CNAs asking or should we tell the nurse and then the nurse talk to the family? Good question. Again, you want to go by your facility uh, policy because here's the problem. If you tell the family, hey, you need to go get button or snap front clothing, you know the next thing they're going to ask you? Well, who's paying for it or why? And then you're going to try to explain, well, it's easier to dress side. Why? Families, they always default back to why. Or even worse, what does that mean? What's wrong with her? And now you're getting into very tricky conversations that you don't, you're not equipped to answer. So my default answer is tell the nurse. Let the nurse go over that with the family because the nurse is the one that's, that's their job is to explain all this. Guys, that's really the role of the nurse is to stand between the medical team and the, the family and the patient and be the translator. So the nurse understands what's happening in the medical world and can explain that in English to the, the family. The nurse can understand what the family is saying and relay that in medical terms to the staff. So that's the nurse's role. Um, I would I would toss that back to the nurse. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah, 90% of a nurse's job is education. 90%. All right. So to review. We're going to ask about clothing preference. We're going to get our clothing before we undress. We'll support all, all joints when lifting. Undress strong arm first. Dress weak arm first. Gather the sleeve and dress the weak arm first. Don't overextend or force movement. Adjust clothing. Dispose of your dirty items and put the call light in the stronger hand. Okay? So I'm going to show you the video on this one because it has really good close-ups. It's going to show you each one of these steps along the way. And then um, after this, we have one more skill to learn. It's a very brief skill. It's very short. It doesn't take a lot of explanation, but we may run two or three minutes over. I'll do my best. Mrs. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. I'm here to help you get dressed. Is that okay? Okay. I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. The first thing that I'll get is a barrier to put on my table to make sure that my supplies remain clean. Mrs. Jones, what would you like to wear today? Your light pink pants and dark pink shirt? Okay. 
Is this the outfit that you described? Wonderful. I'll get a privacy blanket as well. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to spread this privacy blanket out over you. This will keep you warm and help protect your privacy as we do this skill. I'm going to carefully unfold the blanket, being careful not to snap or shake it as I lay it out over you. Once the blanket's in place, I'll pull your sheet down to the end of the bed. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to place your socks on now. We'll take one of the socks, scrunch it all the way up to the toe seam, put it over the foot, making sure the toe seam is lined up, lift from below and support at the ankle, and smooth the sock over the heel. Now we'll go to the other side. We'll scrunch this sock up, put it over the foot, making sure the toe seam is lined up, lift from below and support at the ankle, and smooth the sock over the heel, minimizing wrinkles. Now we'll help you put your pants on. We're gonna make sure the tag is in the back. I'm going to insert one of my arms into the legs of the pants and scrunch it up so I have control over all the material. We'll then place it over your foot, lift from below, and smooth it over your heel. We're going to repeat on this side. I'm going to put my hand inside to scrunch up the leg of the pants, and then place it over your foot, lifting from below and supporting at the heel while we finish putting on your pants. Okay, Mrs. Jones, now I'm going to lift your pants up over your hips. If I can have you raise up your hips as high as you can on the count of three. One, two, three. I'll make sure that your pants are over your hips and then cover you back up. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to elevate the head of the bed now. Please tell me when you're comfortable. And if I can assist you to lean forward, I'll untie your gown. Make sure you lift at the Thank top you. of the back, not the back of the head. I'm going to tuck a corner of the blanket behind your back as you sit back. And now I'll remove the gown from this side. We're going to undress the strong arm first. Since our care plan indicated your right arm is weak, we'll undress your left arm first. I'm going to the other side of the bed now. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to undress this arm. Being careful to minimize the movement and support the arm at the elbow as I lift it off the bed. We'll remove the soiled gown. We'll go ahead and rest your arm back on the bed. Okay, now I'm going to assist you with your shirt. I'm going to scrunch up the arm of the sleeve and put my hand through backwards, keeping your arm supported on the bed. I'm going to lift your hand and hold it as if we're shaking hands. This will keep all your fingers together as we place the sleeve over my hand and then over yours. Once we have the sleeve in place on your arm, we'll extend your arm out. I'll support at the elbow as I bring the sleeve the rest of the way along your arm. If I can have you sit forward, Ms. Jones, let me assist you. Thank you. Make sure that you remain covered and smooth the shirt along your back. Come on back, Mrs. Jones. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to assist you in putting your other arm in your sleeve. So I'll scrunch it up, put my hand in through backwards. And Ms. Jones, if I could have you reach your arm up and back for me. I'll assist you to put your arm in the sleeve. Okay, Ms. Jones, we'll rest your arm back on the bed now while I straighten your shirt and make sure that it is snapped appropriately. Okay, let me just adjust your clothing to make sure it's neat. Can I have you lean forward for me, please? Thank you. And I'll make sure that this blanket can be removed. 
Okay, Mr. Newton, I'm just going to gather up your privacy blanket and place it in soiled linen along with your gown. I'll be right back. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm just going to adjust your clothing for neatness and appearance and make sure that it's fastened appropriately and that you look good. Very nice. Okay, you have your call light here if you should need anything. Can I get a magazine for you? Okay, I'm just going to throw your barrier away and open your privacy curtain. Now we'll go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. So if you notice during that skill, <clears throat> um, I was working with a mannequin who does not move on her own, but I was able to keep her completely covered during the skill. So we got her dressed without exposing everything that she had. Now, some of your patients aren't going to need that much modesty. They'll be okay getting dressed with you in the room, but we always default to the most modesty until we're told otherwise. Okay. Good. Make sense. Okay. So let's go to our last skill here. We're going to go to page 76 of your book. This is range of motion shoulder. Not very many principles involved here. We have our big four, which are in every single skill. We're going to follow the care plan. We're going to do our opening, evaluate if we need gloves, and do our closing. So the only thing that we really need to learn is skill-specific steps. So let's get into those. Range of motion are exercises that we are going to perform either with or on the patient. Depends. There's two different types of range of motion. There's active range of motion, which the patient does, and we uh, just basically correct. And then there's passive range of motion, which we do, okay? But this gets confusing for students because when you think about exercise, you generally think about the type of exercise that makes people better, improves something. That's not what we're doing. We have a whole department geared toward exercises that make people better. It's physical therapy. That's not us. Physical therapists have to have a doctorate degree. 10 to 12 years of schooling. How long are we here? Can't be us. <laughs> Can't be us. So why do CNAs do exercises then? CNAs are going to do exercises to retain what the patient already has. Now, I can tell you this this week from experience. The more time you're down, the weaker you get, okay? So if we've got a patient who's having surgery or who has a chronic medical condition or something like that, and they're in bed for a couple of days, they are going to get weak. I spent all day yesterday laying on my couch, didn't move, okay? 24 hours laying on my couch. Today, I'm weaker. Okay, today I am weaker. So if somebody had come along and done some range of motion on me yesterday while I was laying on the couch, that would have kept my level of ability consistent. That is what CNAs do. We are just trying to maintain what the patient already has. So we don't do pain. If the patient gets to hear and says, ow, the next one goes below the ow. And then we let the nurse know, hey, we got an ow let them figure out what to do with it, okay? We do exercises to maintain the current level of um, ability. So there's two types of range of motion. There's active, which the patient does, and there's passive, which we do. How would we know which one is required? The care plan, absolutely. And we already know all the principles involved in here. So let's learn the test-specific ones. So we're going to support from below. We know that. We're going to move slowly and smoothly and return all the way to start. All the way to start. Now, there's three exercises that CNAs do. Just three. That's it. 
Physical therapists do about 488. <laughs> we do three. Flexion extension is up, down. So if I take my arm and go up and extend my arm above my head and bring it back down, this is flexion extension. Two halves of the same exercise. One goes up, one comes down. Abduction, adduction. When you abduct a child, you take it away from its family. Don't do that. That's bad. But if you abduct an extremity, you take it away from its family. Adduct brings it back in. So two halves of the same exercise. Okay. And then rotation is an around motion. You always end where you start. Around. These are the three exercises that CNAs can do. This is it. Unless you're trained to do others. So we always follow the care plan. And this care plan is like a recipe. It's going to tell us what body part. It's going to tell us what exercises. And it's going to tell us how many repetitions. As long as we follow that exactly, you can't mess this up. Okay. So this care plan tells us to perform the following range of motion exercise to the resident's left shoulder. Flexion extension and abduction adduction. We'll provide three repetitions of each exercise and the resident is not able to help. That means we're doing it. It's passive. Okay. We want to make sure that we're monitoring for pain throughout the skill. Are you okay? Does this hurt? Everything good? And always make sure you go back to the start position. It has to be a full range of motion. Always return to start. So our step-by-step -step instructions are located here on page 77. I'm going to show you the video for this because, quite frankly, we're out of time. <laughs> the video is quick. And then we're going to go over um, homework. This is literally a two-minute skill. You have five minutes or four minutes to do it. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm great. I need to do some exercises on your left shoulder. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain and go wash my hands. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. I'm going to do a series of exercises. We're going to repeat each one three times each. The first one's going to be a flexion extension where I raise your arm over your head and back down to the bed, and we'll do that three times. Is that okay? Okay. I'll do all the work. All you have to do is let me know if there's any pain or discomfort. Okay. I'll stretch your arm out here to start. So we're going to raise it above your head and back down to the bed three times. Okay. Supporting at both joints. We're going to go all the way up and all the way back down. Feel okay? Yes. Any pain? No. We're going to go up again and all the way back down. That's two. One more. Up. And all the way back down. That's three. Feel okay? Yes. All right. Your next exercise is an abduction adduction. We're going to swing your arm to the side and back in. We'll do this three times. Okay. Like you're making a snow angel. Okay. So we're going to go all the way up and all the way back down. That's one. All the way up. And all the way back down, that's two. All the way up, feel okay? Mm -hmm. And all the way back down, that's three. Are you comfortable? Yes. Can I get you anything, such as a magazine? No, no. Okay, your environment is clean. Here's your call light. If you should need anything at all, please let me know. So I'll go ahead and open your curtain. And there's nothing else that you need? No, ma'am. Okay, I'm gonna go wash my hands. Thank you. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll review all the steps of my skill make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. If I got to pick my skill for the test, <laughs> that's the one I would pick. We have two more range of motions that we're going to learn throughout the program. They're all done the same way, just on different body parts. So um, these are easy skills to learn. Any questions on any of that? 
All right, so Saturday I do have a CPR class here. You don't have to pre-register. You can just show up Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, the cost for you guys is $45. The cost for outsiders, anyone not currently enrolled, is $55. You'll get your certificate the same day. You have uh, two chapters of homework tonight. We did talk about this four hours ago. I know it was a long time ago. Um, chapters two and three. They are long chapters, so you want to... Um, Judge your time accordingly. Don't wait until 9 o'clock Sunday night because you're probably not going to get it all done. Okay. And uh, the next steps, um, open your wrap-up emails. Everybody get a wrap-up email? Okay. All right. Um, that has links, and it, it will help you kind of wrap up what we did in class that day. Um, you can watch a replay of today's class. It will be in that um, email, and you probably got an invitation to join the online course. As well, yeah, I, think it expired. I opened mine and I said expired. I'm valid. Okay, um, I'll, I'll resend. Sure. Yeah, I'll resend. Okay. Anybody that didn't claim it. Next class is Monday at nine. You do need to bring your blood pressure cups and stethoscopes with you on Monday because we are going to learn blood pressure. Okay, and review sheets. Let me go ahead and pass them out. Remember, if I ever forget the review sheets, they're here on the wall. Nine to one. And it meets right here. Right here in this room. Okay. Yeah. How long is that CPR card good for? Do you know? Two huh? years. Two years. Do you offer a first aid? I'm sorry. No, right now I'm not doing first aid. Um, I, I'm not affiliated with, um, with a training center for first aid yet. I don't think so. Just might be required. The card is not required for the test, right? No, you don't need CPR for the class. You don't need it for the test. You will need it to work in most settings. Is that mouth to mouth CPR? Is it hands on? It, we do. CPR, uh, AED, bag, bag, bag valve, mask, okay. all of that is covered. Okay. And you take a test, you get a card at the end. Is that how it works? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it's easy. I okay. walk you through all okay. of it. All right. It's not a pass fail class. All right. It's a pass, stay until you pass class. Okay. I like that. <laughs> all right. All right. Have a great weekend, guys, and I will see you on Monday. Sorry we ran a little late. Bye bye. I want to order the flashcards. Okay.